So I literally hung around like a weirdo in the paddock, right? Going up and talking to people who didn't know me, right? Like Pedro Acosta, right? You were the fastest bloke out there. And I was like, come on. They were like, honestly, you were so much faster than everybody else. What they, all they want to know is the result, really. And did anybody crash? It just seems a shame that wasn't a little bit more effort put into keeping Rory in the championship. Michael Laverty is the answer. Yeah, it really is. It really is. All people want to see is really good racing on the That's track. All it is. That's the recipe for success. He's the most well-known and experienced TV producer in motorcycle racing today. He was the grid walkman for World Superbikes for many seasons and most recently the voice of Moto2 Free Practice on TNT Sport. That's Charlie Hiscott. This is Off Track, the motorcycle racing podcast. Yeah. Mate, how's the season been? You, you're just off the back of a, well, yeah, before Christmas, the back of a, a MotoGP season of 20 odd rounds. Oh my God, flying like, like, none, like no season I've ever worked on before. Yeah, amazing. Tell me about it. Um, eight races in 10 weeks was hard. It wasn't as hard as we were all, there was quite a lot of trepidation going into it about, you know, it's going to be you know, unbelievable. But actually, um, you know, testament to North One and Gabriella Martin, our production manager. Actually, it's so well organised <clears throat> that there's not a lot of stress. So you just do work. I mean, it's actually it was hard. It was really hard. It was hard mentally and it was hard physically. Um, but it wasn't half as bad as we thought it was going to be. It could have been horrendous, but actually, it worked really well. Um, and you get into a bit of a groove. I've never like I have worked that hard before. I've done it when I was doing BSB World Superbikes and MotoGP before where I was literally, there was a couple of times in my life where I just went from one event to the next. I was never at home. Um, and that was really hard. Whereas this year, um, it was just so well organized. It was very smooth. The racing was really cool. The championship was made, actually, that was one of the really big things um, is that the championship getting really hot at the end, that made all the difference. If the championship's dead, right, everyone's just, it just becomes work. But because Pecco and Jorge Martin were, were, were battling so well and it was seesawing so much, it was fantastic. So quite often you walk out of a meeting, it's surprising how, what an effect it has on everybody, everybody at the event. Um, you know, if you leave after a really good race and the championship's hot, everybody leaves on a high. It's weird. It has a, you know, it affects everybody. If the championship had died early, it would have been a completely different story. But so actually it was really good. It was very hard. <clears throat> it was a long season, um, but a lot was going on. It was really challenging. So yeah, it was a really good season, actually. A really good season. I really enjoyed it, actually. It's nice. It was my first season where I worked on one championship. So it was like so nice to just focus in on one thing. And I was commentating on Moto2. Um, so I had one thing to focus on and I found that really hard. It was a real challenge, but oh my God, it was really nice to really focus in on something. So it was cool. It was a really good year, actually, I have to say. Really how, how do you adapt to commentary from doing your floor manager and production work really and badly. the grid work from World Superbikes? World's Superbike? worst commentator. And what made it Why? worse? Um, because you need certain skills to be a commentator. I've been a com com commentary producer for a long time. And, you know, to be a commentator, you need, um, you need some really hard skills that I don't have. You know, you can, and, and, and I know that because I've been a producer for such a long time, but um, it's really hard. And I actually work, you know, I work with Gavin Emmett, who is, you know, an exceptional commentator and who was brilliant to me and really helped me a lot. And Neil Hodgson as well, who is a great, um, you know, he's not a lead, um, but they worked, they worked really hard to help me. So it was cool. It was cool. I really, I actually, when I first started doing it, I literally pulled my hair out. My hair fell out. I stressed about it. I had to do a, literally, you can't believe how hard it is to hold something together for 40 minutes, especially on a Moto2 Free Practice 1, which is gonna be flipping dull. Um, but actually, Neil and Gav worked really hard. Gav was giving me a lot of advice. Neil would work really hard as my co-commentator. Sometimes we'd have a third mic in there with Michael Laverty or someone like that, or Sylvan, or, or a guest maybe. Um, so by sort of mid-season, I'd kind of <clears throat> got a handle. I put so much work into it, watching races. I'd watch all last year, even right up until the last round. I'd watch all the races from the weekend before because my memory's crap, so I had to polish up on it. Um, last year's races, what happened at the race last year, I'd have all this information. And it's a process, it's like doing podcasts. You learn, you know, like my first one, my first couple, I'd go in there and I'd have a piece of paper with a whole load of crap to ask whoever I was with. And, you know, the first one I got through it, I was like, I'd get 20 minutes into it. 
and I've used all my information. And the thing is, is I'm not like, I don't consider myself to be an ex rider. So I'm not going to sit there and talk about what's seeing on track. I didn't know Moto2 that well. It's a very hard one to research because there's not a lot of information about Moto2 and Moto3 on the internet. MotoGP seem to pretty much ignore Moto2 and Moto3. Um, so there's hard, so it's really hard. So there was a couple of times where I found myself where, and that's what a lead commentator does is they fill like those gaps. Yeah. And they're brilliant out of Gavin's just, you know, so confident in talking about whatever's happening on screen or he knows the people, you know, he's got so much information. So I found it really hard, but by mid season, I'd sort of got a bit of a handle into it. I had a lot of residual information then because we'd had half a season. So I could remember he'd done this or he'd done that, or, you know, who, who did what to who and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> so I had a bit more information then and it got a bit easier and I started to really enjoy it. And actually um, what made it, what makes it is the people that you work with and like Hodgie put so much effort into it. He knew that I was struggling. So he would, you know, the moment he could see me dry up, he would jump in and, and start talking or ask me a question or whatever. So luckily, I mean, it's such a hard gig, right? It is such a hard job. And, and commentators and lead commentators um, are amazing. They're, they're, there's a real skill to it. And luckily, I did it with two people who were flipping brilliant and really and also looked after me really, really well. So and I got a great boss who was also really helping me. There was a couple of other people behind the scenes um, who helped me. So I got through it. It was cool. And I enjoyed it at the end. It was cool. The important thing is to enjoy it. That's it is, massive yeah. because then it you is. get the true you coming out of it yeah. as well and you're not and that, sort of that, that, staccato. That was the first thing I've always been aware in, in my whole career that because I work on so many different things, I was definitely jack of all trades and master of none. I wasn't an expert in flipping anything. And then I got to do this one thing, focusing on one championship and actually um, I really enjoyed it. It was really cool. It was nice to really hone in on one thing. It was cool. And it was new to me. I didn't know a lot of the riders. I didn't have a great deal of background information for it. Luckily, we had Sam Lowe's and Jake Dixon in there. Rory was in there this year. So I had some people I could go and talk to. And I found a new skill, which is that the only way really to deal with these things is to go out and talk to people. So I literally hung around like a weirdo in the paddock right going up and talking to people who didn't know me right like Pedro Acosta right he's a tricky tricky customer and he didn't want to talk to me I'll tell you what he did not want to talk to me but I had to force myself to go and go hi Pedro I'm a commentator for British television can I ask you some questions and it basically Pedro is quite a tricky one because by then he's his ego is taking over he's doing really really well but then you go and meet other riders like um oh, I can't think now but most of them are like so Fermin cool. Aldiger and Fermin Alonso Aldiger, right? And all of those guys, yeah. right? Alonso Lopez, um, Aaron Canet. Yeah. So nice. You go up and, like, you know, I'm some dork who walks up to him and goes, Can I ask you some questions? And they're really, really nice. In fact, all of them. Pedro was the hard one because yeah. obviously he was doing really, really well. He was, you know, he just didn't have time for me, which is cool. I understand that. But generally, um, you know, as you know, riders like to talk about themselves, but actually if you go up there and actually if you ask them a decent question to start with and you, they, as soon as they understand that you know what you're talking about, they're happy to chat. And that was the thing. So I, I built a few relationships over the year, literally by hanging around in the paddock and going and talking to people. They knew I had my TNT Sport jacket on or my BT Sport jacket on. So they know you're part of the media. And then when they realise that you know what you're talking about and you're not going to, you're not just there being a, a plonker who wants to talk to them. Um, generally, they're all really cool. And I had Jake and Sam and Rory and they were brilliant, you know, they, they, like Sam particularly, totally understood where I was. I've known Sam for his whole career and most of my career. And Sam would really look after me, right? So he knew that I was gagging for information. So he would be brilliant at coming up and he would offer all the information he could, um, come down any time, just Jake was the same, Rory was the same. And they were just like, um, like friends, do you know what I mean? They, they understood that I was, they knew that I was struggling with it and stuff like that. So they made real allowances for me and they were absolutely flipping lovely for me. So I had every advantage, do you know what I mean? I was lucky in that aspect. It'd be horrible to go in and do, you know, um, downhill snowboarding, right? Where you just, you'd be screwed. You'd be absolutely fucked, yeah? Whereas actually I did know a lot of people. People would help me out. I know how to, um, you know, go and introduce myself to people and ask a decent question and stuff. So it worked out all right. I enjoyed it. It was cool. Yeah. We, we've we seen you on, on the screens at World Superbike. We'll come to that later in the conversation. You've done BSB. We've seen you in the background on the grid and mm. directing people where you need to be here and James and the cameraman. Let's roll it right back. How did Charlie Hiscott start in the TV business and end up where you are now? Oh, blimey. Yeah, that is a long time ago. Um, so I got, I, left, I got kicked out of school, basically, when I was really young, when I was 14, 13. And I went and did um, work experience for a film editor in Soho. And um, they, I went back to school and they said, well, look, 
we don't really like you. So if you want to carry on doing work experience, then you can. So I started doing work experience for a film editor in Soho when it was film, actual physical 35 mil film. And I started off as a runner for him when I was, well, it started when I was 13 and I went sort of full time when I was 14. I had to go and register at school every now and again. And um, I was running around Soho. I was commuting into Soho every day from the age of 14. My sister was working in for a production company in London, so I'd go with her. And um, I was in and out of London every day. And then I got a job. So when I was 16 and left school officially, I didn't take any exams, didn't take any GCSEs, nothing. I then went and worked for a really successful um, TV production company who did a lot of commercials. <clears throat> got in with a director there for Derek Coots. Who me and Su actually Su me and Susie, we, you know, when you go back through your life and you realise you've crossed paths with a few people, Susie, I crossed paths with. We both worked for Derek Coots at some stage, and Jack Bonacle, I crossed paths with. We were both working. We were working in Soho at the same time together. Um, so did that. Um, but I was a runner for a couple of years in TV commercials. Then started working on films. I worked on. Um, I started getting jobs as a location manager, and then I became a second assistant director. Um, and for a bit, I was like the youngest second assistant director in the film business in working in Soho, built a bit of a name up for myself. I was actually doing really well. I sh fucking last thing I should have done was go get into motorbike racing, right? Because that's where it all went up the shitter because I was actually doing really well. I, had a, I was building quite a good career. I was working on feature films. I worked on train spotting and I was working on a lot of pop promos as a second assistant. I was only really good. I was only, I'd have been in my early 20s, 19, 20, 21, and doing really, really well. And then when I got to about 24, I was really getting quite established. I was looking at changing into becoming a first assistant director. I was working on quite a lot of stuff. I'd worked on feature films and animated films and a lot of pop stuff um, and a lot of commercials. I worked on millions of commercials. I worked on all the Gold Blend commercials, all the OXO commercials and all that shit um, back in the 80s and uh, 80s and 90s, sorry. And then um, I went to Australia when I was about 24 years old. And when I went to Australia, I suddenly decided I sort of got into motorbikes when I was, I bought my, got my first bike when I was 17. I bought an FZ 750. I had a mate who was really into bikes who got me into bikes really early. Got a bike at um, 17, passed my bike test, got an FZ 750 when I was 17. And um, everyone just thought I was going to die. No one thought I was going to live until I was 18. And then no one thought I was going to live till I was 19. Anyway, I survived. And then I, there was a thing in those days called, there was a magazine called Performance Bikes, right? Which I'm sure you'll remember. Absolutely. And they had a thing called the Frenzy. And I went to a couple of Frenzies and I'll never forget it. It was one of the most memorable parts of my life was that I went to this Frenzy on, a sh on my shitty, beaten out, crappy old FZ750. And there were some good riders there, like Simon Hargreaves and some of the journalists yeah. were there and they were all on blades and stuff like <clears> that. <throat> and... Um, my, I sat down next to my mates. I'd been out and done my first ever session on the, on the track at Cadwell. And I went back to my mates and they were like, I'll I never forget this, right? I sat down on the grandstand there and they were looking at me like, and I was like, what? And they were like, you were the fastest bloke out there. And I was like, come on. They were like, honestly, you were so much faster than everybody else. So it, it went from there basically. And then I ended up doing a track day. I went and did a track school with Nigel Bosworth on FZR 400s at um, Cadwell. And he was like, yeah, I've got the certificate somewhere and it says 100% go racing, yeah? So I was then getting into racing, still working in TV. I was working really hard on TV. I was doing really well in television. I was earning really good money. And um, I then went on a trip to Australia. I went traveling in Australia for a year. And when I was in Australia, I was like, right, I'm going racing when I come back. So I came back, started racing. Um, and that was how, that's basically how I got into TV. Yeah, and that was it, yeah. And then... Well, I started racing, that went up the shitter. I had a really bad accident at Cadwell. I was doing really well. I was racing with Jamie Morley and uh, Ray Stringer was helping me out a lot. I was doing really well, winning lots of stuff. Got in with Jamie Morley, who was also doing really, really well for himself. Um, and he had like a truck and stuff like that. So we were sort of coming together and he was helping me. I, Jamie had been racing for quite a long time and motocross and stuff like that. I'd done, I'd literally completely obviously didn't know what, the, didn't know what I was doing. I remember um, I turned up at Cadwell once and Mick Corrigan was there, who was the guy who got James Tozen started. Actually, James yeah. was there as well. Actually, James would have been about, he'd have been about 16, maybe 15 or 16. And um, I was on, I'd bought my own CBR 600 and me and my mate, we'd sort of turned it into a race bike ourselves with no experience at all. We didn't know what we were doing. Anyway, Mick Corrigan turned up and actually it worked for me because he came and I, I remember, I'll never forget this at the top paddock at Cadway. And he came over to me and he was like, are you riding that bike? And I was like, yeah. And he was like, 
he couldn't believe, right? Because I'd literally, I'd made up my own rules about dropping the forks through and like, he was like, this bike is the worst thing. Anyway, about 20 minutes later, he'd pulled the forks back through, he'd done something to the shock and he'd got me off Pirelli's and put me on a set of Dunlops. And I went out and uh, the rest is history. But anyway, it ended up in uh, me having a really bad accident at Cadwell Park, um, a career ender and um, spending a bit of time in hospital, quite a long time in hospital and wheelchairs and stuff like that. And then weirdly after that, I then weirdly met Ian Atkins. I can't even remember how I met Ian, not Ian Atkins, Ian Wheeler. And I can't remember how I met him, but he got me a job um, writing for Motorcycle Racer. I can't remember how I met Ian. It would have been at BSB or something like that. I can't remember. But he then um, got me a job writing for Motorcycle Racer. I did a year working for him. And then someone said to me, there's a BS, there's someone was, someone said to me, go and meet this guy. He's doing the OB at BSB. This was in 1999. And I went and had an interview with this guy and he was like, look, I don't know what's going on at BSB, but he said, get yourself down there and find a job. So I went down there and I found myself a job as a floor manager for BSB in the year 2000. And that was it. I was like, I'd combined my passion. Although I have to say I was pretty, I was pissed off with racing then because my racing career was over. I thought I was going to be world champion. Then I woke up two months later and you're like, yeah, you're not world champion anymore. Your, your racing days are over. So I felt bitter quite bitter about that for quite a long time but anyway I'd managed to combine the two I loved racing so much got into BSB um I met Stuart Higgs pretty pretty you know within a few rounds that I got on really well with Stuart he was really good to me um and he became he just looked after me over years so when as the BSB in those days TV changed channel quite regularly went BSB and then it sorry went to BBC and then it went to Sky and it was on ITV and stuff like that and Stuart would always make sure that me and another guy I worked with called Richard Coventry Cov um, who I'm who you know obviously um, who was the director at the time there he was started off as a vision mixer well Stuart was really good at making sure that wherever the wherever it went we kept our jobs he's like that's your floor manager and that's your director and um, and that went on and I worked on BSB for I don't know 20 years or something like that learned to become a floor manager that led me into Eurosport um, I started off consulting for Eurosport, weirdly, when they first got World Superbikes um, and they knew nothing about it. And so it was like, you know, I was like, well, you should get that guy in, Jamie Whitton, or you should get that guy in or, you know, bring it in only because I knew who people were. And then I ended up getting a job as an assistant producer at Eurosport and blah, blah, blah. And here I am now 15, Ish. 50 and old and tired and talking to you. <laughs> Thanks, mate. <laughs> Well, that's anyway, it for this there episode. We go. Right, anyway. That was a good one anyway. Um, uh, There's the out. You need to get your edit tool out on that one, Dave, I reckon. <laughs> no, I'm not doing that. That's staying so in. A tale of woe. Not at all. Not at all. I think it's a fascinating journey. When you joined BSB, and it was in the early days mm. of, of the TV coverage, and it, it's progressed on to the, the great show that it is now. Yeah. How much of an input did you have into it to make that foundation over the last 20 None. years? Literally none. Oh, over the last 20 years? Yeah. Yeah, still none. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely none. No, I mean, you have a little bit of input. I mean, like it was built, that show, the running order was made by a guy called Ben Miller and a producer called Robbo Farrell. And actually, if you take the running order from, so running orders is our TV program, as you know, right? You have a running order that tells you, and it starts with, um, you know, you come on air and it says you have your titles, and then you have an opener, and then someone says something, and then something happens and blah, 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 right? And what's quite funny is like, if you take, uh, one day I'll find a running order from 1999 and I'm going to look at it and I'm going to show it, and I'm going to get a running order from 2024 and they're identical. So it hasn't actually changed at all, not at all. But what's happened is it's been refined. So, you know, I didn't have anything to do with any of that shit. I was a floor manager, right? And I, but, but I will say that um, Rob and Ben, really, I cut my teeth with them, right? So they taught me about broadcast TV, yeah, and actually, and also producing. So when, you know, it went away from that, they worked for a company called Octagon, which was Sky and <clears throat> stuff like that. And when it came to Eurosport, I knew how BSB, me and Cov together, actually, we, we knew how BSB ran and Stuart knew it and everything. So when Eurosport came on board, I then did have a bit, I didn't have a lot of input, but I had a bit of editorial input in features and I used to cut a lot of the openers. I worked with a really cool guy called Tim Fowden who was really creative. He took over from me. He came in behind me, um, but he was really creative. So he used to cut all really good, like those beautiful openers and closers that you see. That was all, you know, that takes some skill, right? Because, you know, there's 12 rounds of BSB. So that means he needs to be creative, like 
10 times during a show, times, so it's like, it's really, it's quite hard. So you need lots of, so much music and you need ideas and you need like constant, and I, I used to struggle with that actually. Um, but you would have quite a lot of input. And I mean, my input started where I remember when I first had any input in the show was back in the very, very early days where I, I wanted to put Foo Fighters or something like that on for the last bit of music at the end of the day. And they put the Foo Fighters on. I was like, wee, I'm on the TV. But you don't really, I haven't had a lot of input in that show. The show's basically remained the same over the last 20 years and different producers come in and do different things. And you do, you know, but the same shit, it's the same shit. Cameras, people standing around talking, same shit every day. Same shit, same day. But it works. It works really well and actually you can drill into it, right? You can really think about hard how you can change things and oh, how can we, you know, people do come along and you go, how can we make this better? You know, what can we do, blah, blah, blah. But actually, at the end of the day, you know, you, you're at a racetrack, um, you know, people don't, one thing that people don't realise is the limitations we're shooting at film at racetracks, right, is they're noisy, a lot of the time there's stuff going on on the track, you don't have, you know, there's a load of permutations that, you know, and people aren't there on Wednesday when everything's quiet and the riders aren't there on Wednesday. So it's like, it's quite hard. You know, it's like any like any sporting event. It's not an easy place to film at. So you're limited in so many areas and then there's budget and facilities and blah, 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 blah. So you're, you know, you, you don't have a lot of scope for making big drastic changes. You're not, no one's going to come along and turn around and go, I've had a really good idea. Let's completely, you know, that's not going to happen. There's going to be no reform. And I know that, right, because... We've had some really, really good producers come through BSB in my career. Um, you know, starting with Robbo Farrell, Mark Wilkin, who went on to Formula One. There was another guy called Titus Hill, who's doing all the rugby and stuff. They're top line producers. And actually, what you don't want is someone coming along. So you've produced BSB or World Superbikes or whatever. Yeah? And what you don't want is someone coming along behind you and going, hey, I've got all these great ideas and changing it completely and making a much better show. And that's not happened with any of these really good producers because you're so limited with what you've got. Um, I mean, BSB particularly, actually, it's such an entertaining series. You don't need, it's not like, um, it's not like bowling, yeah? <laughs> Which is, you know, it's got, BSB provides all the entertainment you need, right? The people, the crashes, all the shit that goes on, big crowds. It's got everything. It's spectacular to look at. You just need some good music. You need some really good pundits to talk about with obviously Wit and Shaky and, you know, Matt Roberts and people like that. They've had a, a real... You know, it couldn't, it's very hard to improve when you've got the recipe so good, that's really hard. To, I think that's really hard to improve on. And the testament to that is that we've had a number of really good producers come through and none of them have made it, have done anything really dramatic with it. So working through BSB as, as we bring the timeline, start to bring it forward a little bit. Main presenters, Craig Doyle. Craig Doyle, yeah. Craig Doyle was Started the first one. Craig, yeah. Big TC, Tony Carter. Yeah, Tony, yep. Yeah. And then Matt Roberts. Matt, Matt, yeah, Matt ever since, yeah. So what, what are your best memories yeah. of working with those? Three very uh, different people in terms of knowledge and presenting. Craig Doyle was, it was and is, and I worked with Craig on MotoGP. Hmm. I've, I've bumped into Craig a few times. I've worked with him a few times, and I think he's the best producer I've ever, best presenter I've ever worked with. Funniest, nicest, have a laugh with. Um, Matt Roberts has been a, great, been a great friend to me over the years. Um, also... Also, a brilliant presenter. Matt's just just got it in natural ability. Um, the thing I remember about Craig, that was in, they were different times, right? So when Matt was yes. doing it, it was a different, the world was a different place. So when Craig was doing it, we used to get rat assed all the time. All the time we'd have these massive, you know, it was just the way, it was the way the world was, the way TV was. So, you know, you'd have some really, really good nights out. We'd have some really funny conversations. Craig was flipping brilliant, I have to say, and was just completely got it as a presenter because he would, he just got it. He didn't, you know, it wasn't about him. It was about asking questions, all that sort of stuff. And then Tony Carter was a completely different um, kettle of fish, but Tony was kind of okay. He knew his stuff and Tony was very good at getting, um, Getting, getting good out of the guests that he had. He would make them relaxed and he'd create and make people laugh and stuff like that. Um, and then Matt came along and Matt was just a pleasure to work with the whole time. Matt's become a really good friend of mine and um, the most solid presenter I've probably ever worked with. You know what I mean? Just um, knows everybody. Everybody likes him. He knows what's going on around him. Uh, to be honest with you, Matt, I think is... Um, I think he f he needs pushing a little bit with with BSB because he knows everybody so well. He's very enthusiastic about it, but when you do it for that amount of time, you know everybody needs a bit of bit of pushing along a little bit. And Matt's really really good at that stuff. 
and he does world superbikes he just walks into it and makes it look so easy and actually I've, I've tried to do a bit of that sort of stuff myself and it's like lead commentating people don't realize how hard it is matt makes it look so easy um but it ain't do you know what i mean it, it just isn't so yeah i've got good memories i mean i work with some cool people i have to say um doily's always been a really good laugh and, I'm, and matt's a great guy to work with i have to say so yeah i mean i've done i've got a lot out of bsb it's been a great championship to work on and i've loved working there and um like i said you know i've worked there for quite a long time you make a lot of friends whether it's in the paddock or in race control or in the tv people i mean it was run by a company called televideo for a long time they used to do all the facilities so you get to know the cameraman and it was just like a, i honestly felt like bsb was my home for quite a long time do you know what i mean so and stuart was always really good to me stuart looked after me so i have really fond memories of bsb i've had some great times there some really great times double edged question in fact two questions what's the most difficult moment you experienced in bsb Oh, um, Jamie Morley's crash, the, the big crash out of Brown's Hatch there. I don't remember what year it was now. Um, I don't know, 2007, something like that. And we had almost finished for the day and super stocks went out. Um, and there was a horrendous accident in the rain um, going out the back over the country. And it was just awful. I mean, we, it was just awful. Um, and yeah, that was... Yeah, I mean, that springs straight to mind. That's the worst time I've ever had at any racetrack anywhere, ever. <laughs> so not just BSB, but that was a really hard one. Um, there were times at BSB where um, we went through a phase when it was on Sky with, Stuart, with um, Keith Ewan, when Keith was presenting it, and we just seemed to have people getting killed all the time. And there was a year where, I think it was the year at the TT, where DJ died, um... Gus Scott died, or maybe it was, maybe that's my, my memory. 2003. So yeah, maybe I'm getting years confused. Yeah. But there seemed to be a sort of time where actually people got killed all the time. People got killed a lot. Ronnie Smith got killed. I know they weren't all in BSB and stuff no, like that, weren't. but there no. was a time when, like, you know, racing was flipping dangerous. Do you know what I mean? And actually, it was just a really regular thing where you'd come home and, you know, someone else had died. And it was just, you know, it doesn't, doesn't really feel like that now. Um, I think those things have changed, but there was definitely a time where. You know, we'd turn up, I'm sure Stuart would remember these times and Keith definitely would wear. It just seemed to be there was a little bit of a trend where we'd turn up and we'd have to start the show with something horrendous. It with just seemed to get a bit, not, not normalised or anything like that, but there were, there were definitely some dark times in BSB where, you know, I, 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 don't, I, I can't explain it, but there were definitely times there when there was definitely a, bit, a fair bit of death following us around and it was kids and young people and old people. And it wasn't just... I don't think it was just BSB, it was the TT and, you know, some of the journals, like, like Gus and Ronnie and yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, They were really, and I, I knew those guys pretty well. So that was all really quite hard. And it just seems back, you know, that, there was just a time where there was a few years or a little bit of a time where we used to deal with that shit all the time. I remember thinking, fuck, we deal with these people. You know, I know it's still there, it's not gone away, but it just seemed to be quite a regular thing. It seemed to be part of the job almost, you know, where... Um, where you had to deal with that shit and we were making tributes all the time or we were dealing with that, you know, I, you ended up becoming, um, you know, you became an expert on dealing with these situations. Do you know what I mean? Like we've all become experts on dealing with, you know, particularly people like Stuart and, you know, um, Matt and Keith and stuff. They're the people who actually do actually physically have to deal with it at the time. Um, but that seems to have become, I mean, it feels like that's become much, much less now with the improvements in safety, you know, BSB is adapted and, you know, you seem to get it more in, I mean, MotoGP is the one that the championship that looks, or World Superbikes is the championship that looks like having more problems. Um, but BSB, there was there was a time when it was just, uh, seemed to happen quite a lot. So I remember that, I remember mm. thinking that, you know, that's a, a, a slightly negative side of it, but that's basically it. And then all, all the negatives come down to that. That's what motorbike racing it's is. Motorbike, yeah, it's the, the sport we're in, isn't it's it? It's the sport we're in, yeah, exactly. You don't get that in... You know, tennis or any of that shit, you don't no. have to put up with that sort of stuff. But we have to deal with that shit and we have to deal with it fairly, maybe less so now, but we used to have to deal with that quite a lot. To flip that around, what's your best memories? What, from BSB? Yeah. Oh, my God. Well, they're all piss-ups, aren't they, <laughs> obviously? <laughs> oh, I'll tell you what, my best memory, actually, I've said this before, actually, the thing, my resounding memory, the best thing I've ever had at BSB was Hopper and Hill at Brands Hatch that weekend. That was just, I'll never forget that. 
Um, but there's been a load of them. I mean, Shaky, some of Shaky's championship wins were just incredible with big parties afterwards. Nick Morgan's parties were always unbelievable. Um, so there's a, there's, I mean, that's the nice thing. As I can tell you in the negative straight away, right? There are people, people getting lost, yeah? Yeah, 100%. Um, the positives are, oh, there's flipping millions of them. I don't know. They're just <laughs> every, end of, every end of season. Um, you know, some of the championships that have gone there, Tommy Hill, what a lovely guy, Shaky. I'm working with Shaky, and that, actually now I know Shaky personally as a friend. That's like a real, um, oh, I don't know how you describe it, what do you call it, a treat. You know, it's just yeah. like, fucking hell. I know Shaky, he's, he's a mate of mine now, right? And then having known him through when he was really successful and doing all that sort of stuff, they were amazing years. Um, Tommy was amazing. I loved working with Tommy, he was such a nice guy. Um, and then going back to Neil McKenzie, John Reynolds, <laughs> showing my age, you know, Neil was brilliant. I remember John Reynolds had a real, John, I learned a lot from John Reynolds. He bit my head off a few times for doing things. I can't remember what it was. There was a couple of times where JR literally ripped my flipping head off and I deservedly so, right? I jumped and asked him something that wasn't appropriate or something like that. And, you know, going back to the good old days of Neil and John Reynolds and St um, Hizzy and people like that, you know, yeah. Hizzy was a flipping, I loved it. Like Hizzy was a tricky guy, right? I didn't know him particularly well, but I had to deal with him a lot, right? And particularly like I had to get him in to film him and do onboard laps and stuff like that. And he was a flipping lovely, lovely guy. So like, there's millions of good times. And like, I, you know, I, I look back on that part of my career with just nothing but really good stuff. Do you know what I mean? I learned a lot from all those people and I worked with some flipping amazing people. I mean, Hizzy, flipping hell. I forgot I'd even worked with Hizzy, do you know what I mean? And then you, you know, you look it back and you think, flipping hell. Yeah, I worked with some really cool people. Neil McKenzie was amazing. The Cadbury's Boost Yamaha days. Rob McElnay, um, who was lovely to me. I haven't seen him for a long time, Rob Mack, but what a flipping legend he was. DJ, you know, some of the people, that's always been the best part of my job and still is to this day, the best part of the job is the people you get to meet. It's not the traveling around the world or doing all the shit and crap and the piss and doing the job and the producing and all that crap. That's all cool, right? I, I like all that stuff. But I tell you what, the people that you work with, they're the people that, that that's the rich part of it, without a doubt. It's what this is all about, isn't it? The sport, it is, yeah. I think, survives and, 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 on the people and, and, and side BSB of things. BSB has had a whole host of really amazing people come through it. It really has. And I've, and I've known all of them. Well, from 1999 onwards. Has it helped that you're a fan of the sport as well? Yeah, well, yeah, massive fan. I mean, that's the thing that when I had my racing accident, like I, I, I should, with hindsight now, really, I should have gone back into the film business um, because that would have been much more lucrative to me. And I had a really good reputation there, but I ended up starting off as a floor manager or as a runner or whatever you want to call it um, because I love motorbike bike racing. And even though I was bitter towards what had happened to my racing career, um, I got to work with Jamie Whittam and people like that and like, you know, James is one of my best friends and he was an inspiration and working with him in those early days and Keith Hewan as well, you know. Um, it was a, it was a, not something that I had any control over. It was like, fucking, I'm doing that shit, right? <laughs> you want me to go there? What are you going to do this weekend? You can go and do something normal or you can go and work with those dudes over there. Be at Hickstead or Donington Park. What's yeah, your choice? Yeah, exactly, yeah. So it was people and it's, you know, basically, yeah, it's down to the people that I work with, particularly people like Wit, I have to say. Wit's been a really strong part of my life, do you know what I mean? All the way through actually, from the early days. And weirdly, I met Wit long before I got into racing. When I was working in um, adverts, which I was, so I was into bikes. I got into bike racing, watching it as a fan when yeah. I was really young, when I was 15. My dad hated motorbikes, right? Despised them, yeah? And, but I can't, I don't know why, but I got into them. And I remember Jamie Whittam when he was, you know, an up and coming rider and he was like a bit of a hero of mine and I love Jamie Whittam and then I worked on an advert for um for a car polish called Murr. Yeah. I mean, this is going back to I, I can't remember what year it was but it's a long time I'd, I'd have been 17 I had a Citroen BX I was 17 right <laughs> and I worked on this Murr commercial right Whit will love me telling this story and it was a um it was a massive shoot right with about five cameras it had a locked off camera big directors and producers i was a runner or something on it right and it was classic cars and they would their trick with this polish was they'd go and put it on your car and they'd polish your car and then they'd set fire to it and go look how strong this polish is blah 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 right bollocks all that rubbish but they had about 500 cars there and a lorry and a truck and all this shit and um um antique cars and stuff and they were putting polish on and burning it and cameras and all this sort of stuff and then we'd been on it for a day and then on the second day um, Jamie Whitman arrived and 
I'll never forget this, right? I've still got one of my one of the oldest photos I own is of this day, right? And so you've got 500 car owners and you've got a massive TV crew with a really important director and a director of photography and a lighting cameraman, all, this, all these flipping people, right? <laughs> and then Wit turns up with Mick Grant, right? And it, on his, um, I think it was a Durex Suzuki, Durex Suzuki. Year, right? 89. And he pulls up at the side, right? And I remember thinking, fucking, that's Jamie Witt, right? So I couldn't take my eye off him, yeah? And they wheel this old bike, not old bike, they wheel this super bike out and put it on the thing, fire up, and everyone's sort of looking over there and the director, and there were quite a few, there were quite a few girls around because there was polish and, you know, stuff like that. Anyway, it was at Bruntingthorpe and Witt gets on his bike, right? Puts his leathers on, puts his helmet on, right? And just goes to warm the bike up, right? And goes off around the corner and goes up the road and he goes, little wheelie, and I'll tell you what, literally the whole thing ground to a halt. He did nothing, right, but the whole shoot stopped to watch him, yeah? And he shot off over the distance and he came back round, blah, 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 and then he really came round the corner and went fucking up the thing and everyone literally, the whole shoot ground to a halt. And I remember being mesmerised thinking, you know, it was what we all love, the, it was the thing that we all love about motorbikes, right? It's the coolest things on the planet. Anyway, so this is a quite a long-winded story, but we all then go to lunch, right? The whole crew, all the, all the people who own cars stay and have their own lunch, but the whole crew goes for lunch and Wit's part of the talent, right? So he comes with us. And I sat and had a pie, I beelined for Wit, right? And I sat, I remember sitting in this shitty little pub, I don't even know whether Wit even remembers this, but I sat in this shitty little pub opposite Wit and I was like, oh, talking to him, all this sort of stuff. Anyway, the funny thing is, is there was this, we had this locked off camera, which was like, um, in those days, it was for a 35 mil camera, right? And it was for a, um, a time-lapse shot, yeah? okay. but there were cones around it. No one was allowed anyway. If you went anywhere near this camera, the, everybody would kill you, right? It was death. <laughs> anyway, I remember driving back from this pub with a crew, right? And there were probably been about like 20 cars coming up over the hill over Thruxton, yeah? No one was allowed in this camera. And the crew were all lying astern behind the producer and the director doing 40 mile an hour through Bruntingthorpe on the airstrip there doing 30 mile an hour, lying astern. And Wit, it was a Peugeot, a gold Peugeot 406, right? Wit came past all of us doing flat out over 100 <laughs> mile an hour, right? And then just before we got, you came down the hill and you could see all these cars, all this sort of stuff, but the front of it was this locked off camera and Wit does a handbrake at literally 110, 120 mile an hour, right? Mass smoke and everything, and then pulls up right next to this camera, right? And did not give one single fuck about it, right? And I knew if it had been anyone else, the director would have got out and literally, if it had been me or anyone else, it would be like, <laughs> fuck off, yeah. get, get out of here. But because it was wit, and I remember thinking, that was one of the coolest things I'd ever seen in my life. I've got a photo of wit standing next to my Citroen BX somewhere upstairs. And uh, from that moment on, and then I'm, obviously I then I ended up working with Wit on BSB and we became great mates and uh, Wit's been a great mate to me ever since. But that's my story of him. Fabulous. I'm yeah, with him on was, Friday. I'm going to see him on Friday, that's so I'll what, ask him about that. That's when you realise, right, that motorbikes are the coolest things on the planet. Nothing can outcool a motorbike. I agree completely. It's why we do what we do. It is, yeah. It it's is, the, yeah I wouldn't be sat here if I wasn't is. into my... It, it, yeah. I know it sounds really obvious, yeah. but it, the sport is so incredible. Yeah, it is, yeah. I agree. So, yeah, I am a bit of a fan. How did you make the jump then to World Superbikes from BSB? Just through Eurosport, just through being a producer. I got, um, they got the contract, I think, with doing World Superbikes. I can't remember what year it was. Um, so I worked on there for a long time as a producer and then um, ended up doing interviews and then doing part of it. was just a natural thing, really. I mean, that Eurosport didn't have a lot of people, so it was like, well, no one else did it. So, Charlie, can you ask the questions here? I'd been doing, actually, I'd done some part firm stuff with BSB. So um, I'd been, I was well versed at asking questions. So um, it was just natural, really, just to do BSB, to do World Superbikes, same shit. I started on World Superbikes in about 2000 and know, maybe 2004, something like that. Um, and then started going on site in about 2006. I, worked, I used to do lots of features and stuff for it and then started going on site there, doing features, filming. Um, and it used to be done, we used to send stuff back. It's all been done, te the technology's changed quite a lot over the last number of years. Um, and then, um, so I would go out there and film a lot of stuff. And then Tim Fowden started, um, take, took over as producer of the whole thing. And he was like, can you do grid walks? And I was like, no, not in a million years. And it came in a, came at a time in my life, and that's what I love about Tim is he was really um, he was cool. He saw my he saw my skills, and he he's really creative. Yeah, he could see that I could bring something to the program, and he was like, "Come on, you know, we need someone to do it, and we need to fill this time. So why don't you do a grid walk?" And I was like, I was just at a time in my life where I'd gone through a really bad breakup, and it was like, well, 
I had that sort of like, <sighs> fuck it. <laughs> so I did it and, it and it worked out all right. And actually Tim was really cool. He looked after me and, um, and I started doing grid walks and barring a few ups and downs and a few, <sighs> a few mishaps. Um, that was how it sort of panned out really. Which mishaps in particular, Charlie? Well, everybody knows it was Gregorio Levia. I had a bit of a fallout with Gregorio Levia, but I was having a really bad time in my life. And um, I just, you know, it, didn't, it wasn't my finest hour. But anyway, it turned out all right in the end. I, I got a bit stroppy with Gregorio at, at Imola one year. I don't know whether some people will remember it, some people won't. But um, he was procrastinating and I didn't give him quite the respect that I should have done. And I ended up getting to a bit of an argument with him, just sort of having a bit of a dig at him. Um, and I, and I think, you know, anyway, I went and apologised to him and Gregorio was absolutely cool about it and I got on with him fine ever since. Although I think he probably does still hate me. Um, not undeserved, not not incorrectly so, but that's Gregorio. Um, but yeah, not my finest hour. But yeah, I mean, I was loose. I was, I'm not a presenter. Do you know I was always loose and that was what people, and that was, I think that was why it lasted quite as long as it did because I was loose and I wasn't normal and I wasn't going to be corporate. And, you know, I had a little bit of... Um, um, don't give a fuck. A little bit of that, do you know what I mean? But I also had a good rapport with all the riders. I've been in World Superbikes for a long time, so I knew them all really well. They were all really cool. I could speak to anybody. Um, I'd call a lot of them friends. And World Superbikes like the perfect paddock, really, because BSB is a great paddock, but it can be quite insular. Whereas World Superbikes is a slightly bigger paddock and you have a lot of people with a lot of different nationalities so it's much it's not it doesn't have that quite bit of um everybody you know what it's like dave everybody knows everybody in bsb and there can be a bit of backbiting and that sort of stuff it's a normal thing it's like a traveling circus yeah and world superbikes was just a little bit bigger where you didn't quite get that it's almost like the perfect it's not quite as um um sterile as Mert gp can be sometimes um and world superbikes was just the perfect place to work it really was all the riders I mean, when i went there wasn't long was when we had all the influx of all the British riders. You know, there was a, a year when Cal and Jonathan and Tom Sykes and Leon Carrion, all those guys all flooded to World Superbikes. Then the Lowe's brothers arrived and Sam was there. And it was just, um, it was flipping brilliant. And all of those guys were just fan bloody tastic to work with. I love them all. They're all brilliant people. All of them were flipping brilliant. And actually, what a f how lucky, like when I first got there, it was um, Troy Bayliss who was, Doing everything and Troy was the nicest guy. I was really lucky, right? Troy Bellis was the nicest guy I ever worked with. I got to work with um, a brilliant cameraman called Daryl Kibblewhite, Dazzler, as people know him. And you build a rapport with these people because you don't fuck them around and they get to like you and they're happy to interview you even when they've had the shit, you know. And yeah. Troy Bellis had a crash or whatever. And that was part of that, a big part of that is your cameraman as well. They don't want to be faffed around and they know that we turn up, we literally get straight on with it and not, not mess them around. So you build up a good rapport with these people and then. You know, after Troy, it was, I um, can't remember who it must have been people like Tom and then Sylvan and Max Biaggi and those sort of people. And then Jonathan took over and was there for six years. So, you know, and I've got on with all of those people, apart from Max Biaggi, who was, you know, who's Max Biaggi. Um, I always got on really well with those people, particularly Tom and, you know, and then... I, I just, it was really lucky that we, we dominate, you know, the Brits dominated World Superbikes for such a long time, not necessarily in results or whatever, you know, however you want to break it down, but there were loads of Brits there and each and every single one of those British riders was flipping really nice, were really cool people. They'd been through BSB or they'd come from wherever they come from and they were flipping brilliant and they were so nice to work from, they'd do anything, they were easy to work with, you could go and have a drink with them afterwards and it was, you know, it was Great times, do you know what I mean? Great times, really good times. I had some really good times in Worlds. You made those grid walks your own from quite early on. And that, for someone who it wasn't your first world, that must have been a, a big, not a responsibility, but like a personal responsibility to shoulder, to go in and go, like you said, you're in a difficult time of your life with yeah. on, on a personal level. So to then be thrust in to do that and have the focus then, to go in and do the grid walk because everybody loves a grid walk, whether it's yours, whether it's Martin Brundle's, whether it's Simon Crayfars, whether it's yeah. Hodgie's, it's part of the race build-up, whether yeah. it's Whit at BSB, yeah. it's part of the build-up and it's getting that, the latest possible answers from a rider at the most crucial time. I was really lucky. So like, I was just, it was just, it, I, I was really lucky. Like, like talking about, 
doing lead commentary, yeah, where I didn't know anything about Moto2, didn't know any of the riders, I had to go and stand around the paddock. This was the complete opposite, right? Because mm. I knew everybody, I knew everybody really well. World Superbikes is not MotoGP, so everybody, you can talk to anybody. There's, there's no, the only person you can't really talk to is Max B.I.G. Um, but you can go to anyone and ask them anything. And because I hung around with them all the time, I knew everything anyway. They all trusted me. They knew that I wouldn't ask any of them anything that they didn't want to talk about. And I, they also knew that I wouldn't come and talk to them if they didn't want to talk. Um, so there was a little bit of trust and a, and a bit of respect. So everything worked in my favour for that. And that was the complete opposite of lead commentary where actually grid walks, pff, yeah, why not? Fuck it, what have I got to lose? And, and they were easy because World Superbikes is easy. Half of the grid were British. I've known them since they were in BSB. So it was a piece of piss. It was so easy. And I look at, um, I remember Neil Hodgson doing, starting to do grid walks in MotoGP, right? Which is like the world's hardest environment. Apart from the fact, right? Even if you look at the physics, you know, the, the actual physical side of doing grid walks, you turn up on a world superbike grid, there's loads of space. You can see you know, when I'm doing that, I can see him over there and I can see them over there. You turn up in Jerez, right? And do a grid walk in MotoGP, right? You can't see it. It's literally, People are in front of you there. So for Neil, right, when we arrived there 10 years ago as BT Sport, no one had ever even heard of BT Sport. We didn't even have BT Sport jackets. Neil Hodgson had to go around and try and grid walk with people. It was like the world's hardest task, yeah? And it was a flipping nightmare. I know Neil used to pull his hair out of it. It was so hard, yeah? Because they were literally, that's the easiest gig in the world. That's the hardest gig in the world. And that, and that was the difference. So that, that was how I, that was why I did them. And actually it was, um, Tim Fallon was like, well, give them a go, see, see how it goes. So, and like I said, it was all, I would never have done that. I've never wanted to be in front of the camera ever. And it's just kind of happened. And then, you know, Tim was like, if I hadn't have um, been in a crap situation in my life, I'd have said, no, I said, no way, I'm not doing that shit. I'm not doing a grid walk, <laughs> no way. But because I was like, just in that sort of mode, I had literally had nothing to lose. Why not? Fuck it. I'll do it. Yeah, I'll do one. Yeah, have a go. And it worked out okay. It was kind of okay. Worked, worked for a few years. I really enjoyed them. In the end, in the end, I started to really enjoy them because I'd get quite a lot of information. And um, rather than just wandering around and asking people how you feel, I'd get a lot of information. And also, I kind of got, I built, my, my thing was to like dish out gossip that I was hearing from people. And it's like, if you make it clear, like this is just the rumours that I'm hearing, you can say everything that people hear and actually you don't offend anybody. If people would tell me information and you know, you don't have to be a genius to work out what you can and can't say, right? People don't want to be betrayed and people don't want to say things, but a lot of it is, you know, the, the paddock thrives on gossip and rumour, especially in silly season, people put out gossip and rumour. People would, I tell you what, many times I knew, and I won't tell you who it was or who they were, but there were definitely times when riders would come to me and go, <laughs> and you know they're just feeding you shit, right? They're feeding you crap because they're trying to, well, for whatever their reason are, but you know it. But that works for me. And actually for the viewer at home, it's like, well, this is what we're hearing here is that that guy's going to go to the moon and he's going to go to flipping wherever. <laughs> so it kind of, that's, that's, what, that's what it is. Or you can go there and you can say, how do you feel? And they all feel the same before a race. It's like, there's no point doing that. And that was the advantage of World Superbikes is you could, you know, you could ask them anything on the grid. It was, there were a few riders that were a bit nervous, you know, that, that I would that I would be cautious around, do you know what I mean? Um, but generally, you know, most of the guys, Leon Cameo, I'll tell you what, I had some flipping hilarious things. Leon Cameo, Michael van der Mark, Alex Lowe's. I mean, I could say anything to them before a race, right? Other riders would get quite nervous and would be really, you know, if you said the wrong thing, obviously. Jonathan Ray would get very focused before a race, but he would always, you know, he'd always give me a really good answer. But like Mikey van der Mark, I remember me. <laughs> Like literally just before he goes and gets on for a race. Like Mike, incredible, incredible coolness. Alex Lowe's was the same. Leon Cameron was the same. Loris Baz. They were incredibly cool before a race. I mean, they're totally chilled out. Um, I like to think a little bit of that comes from me because I had a good rapport with them and I used to see them a lot and, I, and I, they'd known me for a long time and they knew that I wasn't, you know, it was a bit of fun. It probably relaxed them a little bit, but, um, you know, a lot of them were real standout guys, really nice people, do you know what I mean? And, and, and totally cool considering what they were about to do they were totally cool four minutes before they get on to put their helmet on and go they were laughing and taking the piss out of the way i walk or whatever it was you know in fact mikey van der mark was brilliant i'll tell you what, he came up with some absolute classics so i really enjoyed that part of it when you get a bit of confidence that was really cool how did you develop that role because i find it fascinating because it's what is it three minutes four minutes of tv no they vary i mean depending was, on where you were one, some of them were 12 minutes I did, I did a couple of 12 15 minutes one, one of them right this is hilarious. I remember doing one, I can't remember where it was now. I was doing a grid walk. I think it might have been in Australia. 
and I'm supposed to have someone there give me a countdown, right? Because some of them are, they're really tight for time and they want it, they want it at seven minutes or whatever. They're normally sort of six, seven, eight minutes, but they want them to time, yeah? So I used to have this girl and she used to tell me, give me that or whatever. And <laughs> I can't remember what happened, but I started, started in this grid walk and she was like, and then I never saw her again, right? And she thought, she heard the, the national anthem, that was like a break, that's a break in your grid walk. Yes. And she heard the national anthem and thought that it finished, right? But after the national anthem, I'd carried on. And they'd stayed on me, the Eurosport had stayed on me. So I was like, well, someone's supposed to be telling me to be quiet here, but I've not heard anyone, so I'm just going to carry on talking. So I carried on for about another, like, ten minutes, so literally. And she didn't, she'd gone off, she was sitting having a lunch. <laughs> she didn't realise that I'd carried on on air. Anyway, so you have things like that, but... Um, yeah, I mean, some of them, they, they, all the lengths of them vary and stuff like that. But, I mean, look, at the end of the day, they're, they're, they're everybody's dream. At the end of the day, right, that was the best, you know, one of the really cool things about my job was that you get to talk to those dudes. And bearing in mind, you know, you could be a MotoGP and those people don't want to talk to you. Or you could be in Formula One or you could talk to, you know, the World Superbike dudes are so cool, right? So you can talk to any, all of them, yeah, it's easy. And... Better than that was then you go and you have a race and then you get to talk to the three dudes that have done really well, yeah? And they're also, you know, they're completely different people after they won a race and they're much more happy to talk. So they're like, what a flipping privilege. You know, you've just watched something and there were times like, especially with, through the Jonathan years, right, where Jonathan did really amazing things, truly amazing things. And I would get to go and talk to him afterwards and ask him a question, which was flipping brilliant. I've got a rapport, John, and I've known him his whole career. And we've always got on a right, and we have a rapport with each other, right? So I could go and ask him anything that I wanted. What a flipping brilliant job. I mean, that's a, a bit of a dream, isn't it? I mean, you're, you're doing the same thing here with podcasting, but I would get the guy that could go and ask him about, say, what the fuck were you doing there? Or what happened there? Or, you know, Jesus or whatever. It was flipping brilliant. And that was like one of the bits that I used to love so much. I used to get a real buzz off doing those part firm interviews. And then you'd have to go and talk to people that had crashed or something horrendous had happened. And that was another area where the differences between MotoGP and World Superbikes, I mean, they're, they're totally different entities, right? Because, you know, World Superbikes, there was just me. We were the only broadcaster. They only ever had to talk to me. There was no one around in them apart from me. There was me, Steve English, Gordon Ritchie, and that was it, right? Whereas in MotoGP, there's 11 TV broadcasters and God knows how many other prints and, and, and you know, they're, they're hounded all the time, right? So it's a completely different entity. So I'm not criticising one from another, but with World Superbikes, you know, someone, something really bad would have happened to someone, their championship would have gone up the shitter or something would have happened, but they'd always come out and talk to you, you know, out of, maybe not respect, but just out of, um, you know, human decency, yeah? Most of them would. I mean, there were people that wouldn't occasionally, um, but generally, you know, um, Alex Lowe's, Jonathan Ray was really good. Alex Lowe's, all, all those guys, you know, when they're having some of real shit's happened and their fucking championship's gone up the thing, they've done something stupid or they've had a crash or something like that. They'd always come out and make the time for you because they understood that it was TV, it was important for the championship, they had to do it, and they'd always come out and, you know, there were a few times in Jonathan's career where I had to interview him in really awkward circumstances, right, where, wh whatever they were, and he would always come out you know, we'd have a chat before and I'd say, look, Jonathan, you need to flip in, you know, I had a rapport with them where I could produce them a little bit beforehand. Yeah. Sometimes, not always, right? But sometimes I could say, look, Jonathan, you need to fucking make sure you say this or don't say that or whatever it is. Think about this. Don't, you know, be careful what you say here. Like right? the chat oh, we had before we started. A little bit like that, yeah. <laughs> Maybe a, li a little bit. Well, no, no, not like that at all. But just, just, just to sort of say, look, come on. It's, it's nice that you're going to talk yeah. to me, right? But, but emotions are running high, so don't be daft, yeah? And... They'd always come out and they were really cool and Jonathan was really cool. You know, lots of them were all, you know, I got turned down very few times, do you know what I mean? And they were much more by, I mean, at the end of the day, right, all of the people I'm talking about are all the British riders that I got on so well with that have all been flipping brilliant through their whole careers, yeah, whether they've done well or not, or whatever, happened, what is, whatever has happened, they've always been great with me and the media, do you know what I mean? Because they're British and they're, we've all grown up together, we've all come through BSB and we've all come through World Superbikes together, so... Yeah, it's been, World Superbox has been lovely, do you know what I mean, over the years. Working with those dudes has been amazing. You can't not, can you? You're working with those guys at the front, and then behind you are Wit and Matt and Shaky and, you know, James Hayden has been flipping, you know, those people have been amazing, do you know what I mean? And on Murder GP, then you've got Hodgie and Gav and, you know, I'm not going to ramble on any more about the people <laughs> I work with, but that's the best part of it. That is the cream of it, actually, is the people. The, the time came on to move on from World Superbike into Moto GP. But you look back on your World Superbike career with 
with, with, with yeah with affection. Yeah, I mean the World Superbikes was brilliant. I mean the the, the industry sort of moved on, and that was that was why that sort of journey ended because the, the you know the way the TV business is going. Um, but you know I love my time in World Superbikes. I still you know see Alex Lozer play golf with him quite regularly, obviously, um, and Sam and all those sort of people. So I don't feel like I'm out of it. Um, but yeah, I, I miss the paddock a lot because it's the definitely the nicest paddock to work in. Although, you know, the advantages of working on one championship in MotoGP with all the Merc guys at BT Sport and stuff like that, um, that's also brings its own positives, do you know what I mean? So it's, you know, six of one, half dozen of another. So I've got no regrets, put it that way. That's, that's good to know. How has the industry changed in the, 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 certainly from the motorcycle side of things through BSB, World Superbike, MotoGP, from uh, actual, the actual industry itself and how you work in it? How's that the changed? The racing industry. Um, in the, the TV production industry, how how has your role changed? Oh, right. Uh, in, in, a, in a more yeah, that's a much easier. Oh yeah. well, like, oh no, the racing. The, the, the other questions, a whole podcast on yeah, its own. Yeah, yeah, that, that is. Yeah, it's like, and I, I, I'm not, I'm not expert enough. You need someone who knows a lot more. Sorry, about in your world, bit, how yeah. the TV side yeah, TV, has the TV things changed a lot. Not not really in the last twenty years, but in the last well, since COVID. Um, I mean, like I said, the running orders, the way the TV program looks, hasn't really changed very much at all. But what has happened behind the camera has changed um, beyond recognition. And it's still changing now year by year, literally year by year. It's getting completely different every year, technology, um, but also, you know, environmental issues. All, all sorts of things are changing, everything. But COVID was the one where um, COVID, I think COVID brought the industry forward by about five or six years in one, in a week almost. So with with I mean, I can only tell you what I know, what I learned from B, from BT Sport was that, you know, COVID came along. We they were always planning on, you know, flying. We were thirty five people, thirty five to forty people flying around the world, yeah, in in MotoGP. So that's forty people, forty hotels, five nights a week, all the flights, half the talent, the you know, business class. It's a flipping horrifically expensive business, yeah. And then they were always planning on remote working was definitely a thing before COVID came along and they were talking about, you know, could we have some of these people in London, you know, do we need to send these people here? Could they be doing their job from here and we could be pinging stuff around the world and all that sort of stuff. And then COVID came and it happened overnight. And I literally mean overnight in, in the space of a week, we went from, I was in Australia when COVID came and there was talk about me going to Qatar for the first round of World Super, for the worst round, first round of MotoGP. Motor Michael Lafferty yeah. had got there. And then in the end, everybody was like, nope, everybody's got to go home. MotoGP's not going to happen. So everybody goes home. And then MotoGP did happen. And then BT Sport were literally amazing, right? A guy called Andy Beal, who's the technical manager there, managed to... So that we knew that the race was going to happen, but nobody was going to be there, yeah? And you've got Hodgie in one place, Susie's down in France... M Labs over there, I can't remember who else was, people dotted around all over the flipping place, yeah? And my the, the producer, Kevin Brown, was in, um, what's the flat place? Norfolk. Norfolk. Norfolk, Suffolk. No, Norfolk or Suffolk, yeah. It's Suffolk. All, it's, it's somewhere out there, right? We're way off any, in the... Any, it, anything it, that South Lincolnshire in the, the boondocks, and somewhere that. around there, yeah? Where the, where the broadband ain't great, necessarily, <laughs> right? That's the, important, that's the important part of the story. Anyway, BT Sport... Got really got their shit together and sent bits of kit out to everybody. Even I had some kit at one stage, so I could still do my job from my conservatory, and it just worked, right? So my, my our producer was pressing buttons on something, and we made a flipping TV program, right? And it wasn't just like a cobbled together, hacked together part of crap that was people all over the place. It was a cohesive, proper TV program that actually worked, right? Yeah. So Gavin was commentating for that. It was amazing, literally. And they made this shit. I can't remember what the time scale was because my memory's crap, but it would have been in a, in a matter of days, maybe a week or something like that. This kit was passed out. Hodgie was trying to... I mean, can you imagine Neil Hodgson trying to plug in a wire into anything, right? So he was on FaceTimes with people saying to him, right, you need to plug that wire, you know. He build, has building this stuff. that. It was amazing. He does, he, his <laughs> butler, obviously, um, wasn't there because he had COVID but you know it was like it was a it was really was an incredible achievement right that actually we put on the next show we'd never missed anything and the viewer never missed anything even though the world had completely changed mm. but what that did mean was that when we got to the end of COVID obviously we then went to um we then moved into BT Tower for a year I think or for half a year or whatever it was and when we came back they realized that actually 35 people 
only really 15 of them really need to carry on going because all of this stuff with everybody with their super fast broadband and blah, 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 it all works, right? So I'll tell you what, from now on, these 15 people, they can work in London. Yeah, which is hard, which is really, really hard for them. So then, so we split them into two crews. So we now have, I think it's about 15 people that now go on site and about 15 or 20 people who work in London, yeah? So that's really hard, right? Because A, it splits the team and actually that's, that, that, that communication between these two teams. So this is what my producer does, Kev Brown, which is what he does brilliantly, is he makes sure that those two um, hemispheres are working together and still communicating and working together. Because if you get a lot of, you know, you notice, the viewer would never notice the difference, but we all notice the difference in our workflows and stuff like that. So we all go to, for example, to, we go to Lombok, right? Beautiful. Amazing, right? Big long journey. We moan about the travel. The flights are crap. It's a 38 hour journey, blah, 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 blah. You get there, it's 40 degrees, right? But when you do the job right, it's, it's amazing, right? You're at Lombok, yeah? You can drink beer and, it, and it's lovely, right? But for the other 20 people who are in London, yeah? They have to come down to London, yeah? They stay in a hotel and then they have to go into work at two o'clock in the morning and then they have to work till 12. So they get the jet lag, they get all, they get all of the negatives of working the same hours that we do without the heat and the beer and the beaches and all the nice food, yeah? So it's like, it's really, it's really hard for them. We still, you know, our, our job hasn't changed that much, but it's really hard for those guys, yeah? So and part of the thing that my producer has to do really well is make sure that these two parts still work, still function as well as each other, do you see what I mean? So, and that's really hard because we don't see that, those sort of people. So trying to keep the team together, yes. where there needs to be communication because um, like, for example, so I go and shoot a feature um, all my shit gets sent back to a guy called Jamie, who then has to deal with my stuff, yeah? And he's like, what is all this crap? Yeah, so we have to communicate, yeah? And normally before, we would be, we'd have dinner together, and yes. we'd have a beer together, and I'd go, right, Jamie, how should we do this thing? And he'll go, why don't you do ABC? And I'd go, right, I'll go film that, and you can cut it like that, and blah, 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 perfect. That, doesn't, that can't happen now, so we have to, so Kevin has to make sure that we all are all still communicating and making sure that this thing, that the information is flowing in the right direction, do you know what I mean? And actually, some of the people from London come out to some of the rounds. We've got a, um, we've got the, some of the people in London are just amazing. Like we've got a producer called um, Nikki Deeming who works there. So she'll do a few rounds at home in London, the, coordinating all that sort of stuff. And then she'll come out and work with us over here. So that works really, really well. Um, but it, I mean, it's changed beyond recognition, literally beyond recognition. So now, and I think actually, this is just the start of the change. I think that's going to change. I think the change is going to become much, much more. I think they're, you know, at the end of the day, they, we can analyse television pictures and sport so hard now, right? And actually, the fact remains is that, and I've, this has been, we've, we've known this for a number of years, which we knew at Eurosport really, was that when you look at the viewing figures, the people, the massive majority of people, they turn in on the warm-up lap and then they turn off on the slowdown lap, right? And everything else, they don't, they don't watch any of that. And actually the TV, I think that, you know, the good days of big budgets and sky and business class and all that sort of stuff, those days are over, yeah? They're, they're, they're definitely over. And now it's all about, you know, money saving and stuff like that. So I think that actually the big changes are, you know, are happening, but I think there's also big changes in TV to come. Certainly in sport production and the way things are going to go, I think, I think there, there will be big changes. I mean, we hear things, lots of stuff about, you know, even with things like football, I mean, sport generally is... is decreasing because kids are playing watching TikTok they're not playing sports so much it is it's a decreasing sphere and you know they've got to save money in places we know that flying has become really uncool um so you know they've already so we've gone from 35 people down to 15 already and that was a lot of that was because a it's becoming flipping expensive to fly people around it makes sense now we can send them from London so that, that sort of stuff so I think basically you know and now that they're really working on the fact that actually not that many people watch pre and post a race, for example, that's the one thing I do know about. Maybe they'll start looking at whether we really do need, you know, when you look at the resources that go into building that stuff before the race and the stuff after the race, that's the sort of, I mean, that would seem like a, a tragedy, but yeah. the, the, the industry is now taken over by, it's money has become the thing, it's about the money and the brand and the viewer at home has become, for me, it, we used to make a, the whole point of our, you know, and I know my producer would agree with this, we all grew up saying, what was, the idea is that we're supposed to make something that's entertaining for the dude who's paying, in those days he wasn't even paying, but for the no. dude who's sitting at home, yeah? Yeah. We're, we're here to entertain him. Like, we were in the entertainment business and it's not like that anymore. 
It's about the brand and it's about money and saving money and being seen to be, you know, ecologically friendly, even if you're not. Do you see what I mean? So I think that actually that things are changing. Actually, the what you put out on the television, the programme that you make is becoming less and less important to the brand that's making it. But I think that's a catch-all thing for the way the world is going. I think that's know? the world yeah. in general, but yeah. we're the end consumer. Yeah. I'm sat there on my settee of a weekend when I'm not at BSB. Yeah. I'm watching, and I think the same can be said for a lot of the viewers and, and the listeners, we will sit down and watch a whole afternoon of BSB. Yeah. I have lost countless afternoons and sunny afternoons watching World Superbikes, yeah. BSB, MotoGP, and you absorb everything. And as before, I was even doing, well, I've been doing podcasts now, 11 years. But you absorb that information from your grid walks, from Steve Day or Greg's commentary or Steve English mm. or the... Um, yeah, but you're a super Jack. nerd. Thanks, mate. <laughs> but if you look at, let's say you take... Yes, um, I am. Let's say 350,000 people watch your show, mm. yeah? Probably only 50,000 or probably only a small majority of people are like you. Most people, mm. and this is a thing that, 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 like with football, they say, actually nowadays, people don't even really want to watch football, right? Because what they, what, they, what they want is they want to be across football, right? They don't want to not know about football because they want to be able to talk about it with their friends. So an iPad in the kitchen, they don't, the people don't, the, the way life is now, people don't have time Okay, you do because you're all, I'm joking. I am super I, I, I get it, right? It's true. But it's, it's, this is your business. Yeah? yeah, yeah. But actually, most people don't have time. And that was, that was one of the things that I've always, I, I remember years ago thinking that, we, that Eurosport should have done this years ago, right? Where instead of having that, you know, I, I've always fundamentally disagreed with this, right? But there's a, there are business situations behind yes. this, why it's always happened, right? But actually, most people don't have the time to spend the whole of Saturday and the whole of Sunday watching motorbike racing, right? So really what you want is, you want the two superbike races, probably the super sport race and maybe the super stock race, yeah. wrapped up in a nice little thing that you can watch from three o'clock in the afternoon until five o'clock in the evening, right? That to me would be perfect. But there are commercial interests and stuff like that why that never could happen and never did happen. And then they, you know, when things, when Eurosport started a, um, the Eurosport player, yes. then there was potential for putting other races, like, you know, the Ducati Cup or whatever it was, putting them on there and that on that and blah, 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 blah. But it doesn't work like that. That's not how TV works because it's about money at the end of the day, yeah? So not many people can deal with that amount of um, sport in one day, let alone in one weekend, let alone 22 times in a, in a MotoGP year, right? Who, who, who can possibly deal with that? And football is the same, yeah? So what people don't want is that we like MotoGP and we want to watch motorbike races or you want to watch football, but what you don't want to do is you don't want to feel left out of the loop. So people don't necessarily want to watch football anymore. They just want to know that it's on. They want to know what's going on, right? So whether it's highlights or they've got it on an iPad and the thing. So if you're a TV company, you're going, look, we're sending all these people here to make this amazing program, right? But actually people don't give a fuck about that. What they, all they want to know is the result, really. And did anybody crash? That's all they want to know. And that's, okay, so your 50,000 people want to know about all the stuff that we make. But the 300,000 people, they just want to know if anybody crashed. Yeah. And they just want to know who's won. And that's absolutely it. true. So I think that actually, if, if you break it down, if yeah. you look at it from a, from a big TV company's point of view, that's what they're looking at now. And actually, when you look at the, you know, the costs of flying 35 people around the world or now 15 people around the world or whoever it is or whatever it is, that's where they're going to go. So I think that that's the next sort of bit that's going to get pinched up for me. I don't know, yeah. but that's the way it's looking for me is that I think that they'll be looking at, you know, hmm, you know, these people are expensive. You're a victim of your own success. And the other thing is, you look at the Dawn of World feed and how that's changed. Like, I've worked on MotoGP since 2004, and the Dawn of World feed has gone from, you know, a fairly scrappy, sort of average, fairly span Spanish, weird thing to a really, really polished, super efficient, Slight. fantastically technologically advanced. I mean, it's flipping brilliant, the world feed, yeah? It really is really good. So you go, well, so there, Donna are making this amazing world feed, which we've, we've bought the rights for. So we own that world feed effectively. So we can put anything out on that world feed, but we're going to send these 15 people to make our own shit. Hmm. Let me just have a little think about that just for a little bit. And there you go. That's my feeling, right? This is just my opinion and my, no, my little soapbox. But that's sort of, um, 
that's the way I think that things are heading for me. I could be completely wrong. Having said that, you know, no, I think that's the way it's going. <laughs> yeah. Does it have any bearing that we don't have a British MotoGP rider at the moment? Massive, like huge. And that's one of the things I've learned this year. Yeah, it's huge. You can't grow an audience without a British superstar. That is for absolute sure. What's the answer? Or who is the answer? Michael Laverty is the answer. Yeah, it really is. It really is. Um, yeah, I, learned, I, learned, I mean, this has become a big subject for us with Jake this year. TNT coming on board and Jake Dixon. It's become a real subject, really important thing. And it's vital to have a British rider in MotoGP. And if you haven't got a rider in MotoGP, and actually we're looking at having potentially if Jake... Let's say Jake Bale's on Moto2 at the end of this year. If he doesn't have a good year this year, we're going to have no rider anywhere in MotoGP apart from Scott Ogden and Josh Watley, right? And If they make the grade. If they make the grade, exactly that. And that's, you know, so it's looking like really lean times. So, you know, that's not good for us. So you have to look, and this is where Michael Laverty, who is flipping absolutely amazing, but he has also been screwed over by, not screwed over at all, that's not true. He has also been, his job has been made much, much harder with the change in age limit. So, you know, what would have been achievable for him, you know, when, when you start a team, you know, you, you, you establish your team, you do a year, the team's good, right? The team is good, the bike's good, they work well, okay? Right, let's find another rider. He's really stuck because all the riders that he wants to use are too young. So there's a lag, there's like a two year lag from MLAV and he's got two riders that are, I mean, not the greatest, pretty average, I would say. Scott Ogden and Josh Watley, okay, they're, 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 they're probably, I don't know, but they're not flipping setting the world on fire, that's for sure. Um, and I think that there are other riders who are much younger than them who have got to show far more potential that Michael can't quite use yet, but they're, they are going to be, that's where our new talent's going to come from. And actually with BSB and World Superbikes, BSB especially going off the electronic route, then that becomes much, much harder for someone to come through BSB. I mean, Jake, obviously, and Alex Lowe's, you know, did amazingly to go through the BSB. So I'm not saying it's not a closed door. You can do it. It's harder than it ever but has it's been. It's really hard. It's, and it's getting harder, with, especially, you know, with the way the electronics are going and the way MotoGP is going and stuff. It's getting much, much harder. So the only real route, really, is to come through Michael Laverty's team. And... I think that's where it's been hard because it's hard for him to survive. You bring a sponsor in who's really keen and all that sort of stuff and then you get riders who, who haven't done what you would hope or could potentially have done and, you know, but you're kind of stuck with them. They've not been under um, pressure from anybody behind, have they, in the last, because of the well, age not change. not really, no, but also... There, there's been no pressure no, on Scott exactly. and Josh from Eddie O'Shea, Casey O'Gorman, exactly Johnny that. Garness, Evan yeah, Belford. exactly, all guys, those guys. Carter so the, Brown. And, and that's the point, and, and Michael would like, you know... I don't think, to be brutal about it, I don't think either of his riders have performed well enough to keep their jobs now at the end of this season. I don't think either of them have. So I think given a choice, you'd get two new riders in, yeah? Two new British riders. That's the idea of the academy. And there, are, there is a load of talent lining up behind them, but they're just too young. And that's just, it's just been really awkward for MLAV that this um, age change has happened at a time just when he started this academy team, you know? So that will develop in time and, um, you know, Unless, you know, there are lots of avenues. What's weird is there's now, for me, there's, there's almost too many avenues for young talent to come through. So you've got talent cuts and um, I look at BSB, I'm, I'm a bit out of touch with it in BSB, but there's lots of young, you know, um, Moto3 and different sort of championships and stuff. And really, you kind of want, it's kind of hard to decide who are the best riders in. I don't know whether that's true. That's certainly how I used to think a few years ago. But like I said, I've lost yeah. touch with it a little bit. So you kind of need something like one series where whoever wins that is clearly our best youngster and that can then, he can then go with Michael Lavis. So maybe it needs simplifying a little bit. It seems there's quite a lot of, um, yeah, and I would say that it's the same in Spain with CV and, you know, there's lots of other different Northern Talent Cups and all that sort of stuff. Asia Talent Cup, there's or di rookies, di different things so many. Stuff. So maybe that needs um, a little bit of simplifying. But yeah, we're definitely struggling for talent at the moment while the, until, the, until these guys reach 
18 years old, isn't five, it? Five, six years away, potentially. Uh, if Jake uh, doesn't make the jump, or for whatever reason... Oh, for MotoGP. For MotoGP. Yeah, yeah no, no, sorry, not Moto3. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm quite yeah. confident well, if, if, Eddie O'Shea um, will make his way through. Eddie O'Shea, in Valentino Rossi. Um, yeah, then if you're going to look at when, you know, when the British punter or TNT are going to get really back involved in MotoGP again, then, uh, yeah, it's a long way off, yeah. It is, yeah. Two years... Plus two yeah. years, so the fifth yeah. year. Then that's if it goes well. Yeah, for how long it takes to to adjust. And you know, Jake has taken five seasons to get to where he's yeah. now, but he didn't know the circuits. Moto two, no. and very difficult motorcycles to well, ride. That's where um, that's where I feel absolutely gutted for Rory. I totally understand what happened in that team, right? And I, I know both sides of the story really well, right, or reasonably well. And I understand why the team had to do what they had to do for financial reasons, it's a business, not a team. And I understand why Rory was really pissed off, yeah, because he had a contract and they, they didn't honour it, right? I get both of those sides of things. The sad thing is, is Rory's a really, really talented rider. And not just a talented rider, a very talented person, right? And you need, I think you need all that, the sportsman side of it and the, you know, the correct PR and dealing with TV company, all that stuff, right? That, all, that is all part of it, okay? You can't turn up and be a flipping moron in MotoGP because you'll get sniffed out straight away, right? No matter how, you know, unless you're... 100%. If you're Mark Marquez, fair enough, you can. If you're not Mark Marquez, you can't. And Rory ticked all the boxes, yeah? And the sad thing is with the change to Pirelli next year, yeah? That was going to be the level playing for Rory started his Moto2 career, the hardest Moto2 year of all time. Yeah, the last one on Dunlops is the hardest one ever. Yeah, and Jake is a perfect example of a really talented rider. He spent five years in Moto2 and he's only now just started to win races and get podiums yeah. and stuff fairly regularly and get some poles. Five years. How hard does that make Moto2? And Rory's come in on the hardest year, the last year, singularly the hardest year ever in a in bearing in mind Moto 2 is the hardest world championship no question so you can't do any harder than that and then unluckily for him the shit that's happened between him and the team has happened and he's not going to get another go and that is an absolute flipping travesty but it's the world that we live in it's the nature of the beast and the sport and everything like that there's no yeah. one no one is to blame for any of this sort of thing it's just things that happen in sports some riders are really lucky some riders you know sometimes you need a bit of luck sometimes you get it some riders don't to yeah line. talent's not everything talent's not everything you just need to do something you know sometimes it's you timing and stuff like that but rory's timing was really unlucky and he came in in the hardest year almost impossible to shine on your first year mm -hmm. unless you're pedro costa you know it's hard to shine in motor two in a normal year but the uh, the last year when everybody's you know Everyone around him is used to telling you know it's such a hard series. I feel like that was just like devastatingly unlucky. That's what I'd say. And I think that that maybe has shut the door for him now on the Grand Prix paddock. Yeah, I think if I mean I think he had an option to go to um, Sev Moto Two, CV Moto Two. But the problem with that is that you you know you've got an option to go with CV Moto Two, but it's with a team that have just dropped you. You know, there's no like okay, I'm going to stay in bed with these people who that I feel like I don't particularly trust anyway. Um, so that was also, or you go back to BSB and, you know, at the end of the day, right, you have to look at the fact of you know, earning money. Yeah. Okay. Good way. the fact. Yeah. Earning the money, right? Yeah. You go back to London, Bottom you know, line. Um, earn 150 grand, whatever he's doing next year, and then potentially go on and become the next shaky, right? Win six BSB champions, right? That's his only real option. So you can think about that, or do you go to CV with this company that you don't really trust? Who might screw you on the money, and you might fucking fall over halfway through the season, or another team that, that has a ride and I'm it's three hundred thousand euros. Yeah, exactly. Or that. buy your way a ride, and he doesn't have that kind of backing. And exactly. Do you that. want to buy yourself a ride in a series that you've kind of been a little bit burnt by? Or do you come back to BSB? Carry on. And you never know, you might I end think, up in World Superbikes. I think if there was there, any still, other... Well, he's only 22. I think if there's... I mean, that's the sad, the slightly... Look, I don't want to speak out of turn, but the slightly sad thing is there was obviously a lot of... Um, there was a lot going on behind the scenes to get Jake into MotoGP, right? There, yeah. was, there was big things happening behind yes. the scenes between the two, between companies and stuff. And... It didn't happen for whatever reason, and we we were getting lots and lots of different conflicting messages about what was going to happen. And one minute it was going to happen, and then it yes. wasn't, and it was, and it was blah blah blah. blah. And you hear things from different people, tele television people, riders, whatever. Yeah. Um, and what seems a shame was that okay, I understand that that didn't happen, and for whatever reason, but like 
just use a shame that wasn't a little bit more effort put into keeping Rory in the championship for next year on the Pirellis, because that could have been another, you know, that, that could have been the, that could have been it. Rory could have done well next year. And then before you know it, in three years time, Rory could have been in MotoGP doing really well, yeah? And it's, we're not talking huge amounts of money, you know, so I just think, hmm, you need some luck in motorbike racing. We know this anyway, but it just seems to me like, I thought Rory is a really good rider. He had ticked a lot of other boxes in, you know, mentality and the way that he went about his business, the way he presented himself, nice guy. And it just seems a shame that actually, you know, just seems like a real shame to me. I, I feel, I feel very sad for her. I hope he goes and destroys BSB and does really, really well for himself. But I can't see him coming back now. No, no. I can't see that there's a road open to him. And that, this is now the, I, w I was hoping he would stay because he was that bridge between Jake and Scott and Josh. Yeah. Because you think, okay, so he's only 22, another couple of seasons. Yeah. You get the MotoGP at 24. Yep. And make a fist hey, of it. He could have gone in last next year on Pirelli's and, and flipping destroyed everybody. Exactly. He really could have done. He raced I mean, a superbike on reset. two seasons on Pirelli, it so he knows what they feel. You just don't know. No, but that's we're not going to find that now. No. But if if Jake doesn't go, which I think is a reasonable possibility, even if he wins the championship, it's not guaranteed that he will get a MotoGP berth. It's not guaranteed, but I think if he wins the championship, I think it would really, help. Yeah, it would help a lot. It would help a lot because yeah. Sam got his opportunity, didn't he, without yeah. winning the championship with the Aprilia for a season. Oh, but he was yeah, quite. That's incomparable. But, you can't compare those two things because that was that was like being offered a donkey to ride. No, true. No, it's not the Aprilia. So, so I get it. It's not Sam. Didn't Sam never? That was you know that was another thing saying. Oh, come on. you know, <laughs> you need some luck. Some riders, you know, you see. <laughs> but again, timing. I, I, I don't want to name one. Right right? I don't want to name one. I'm not going to think of one. Nope. But some riders just seem to cruise, you know, into the good. Everything just falls into place for their career, and some riders really find it hard. Actually, Sam was a great one on the Aprilia. Everyone, Scott was the same. Um, you know, that Aprilia was a flipping absolute donkey. Um, I can't remember who it was who turned it down the year before last. Who was it? Is it Furman? Uh, I can't remember. Oh shit! We talk about them quite often in Motor GP. Who? was offered the Aprilia ride a couple of years ago and turned it down. From Moto2? Yeah. And now they're like sitting there kicking themselves <laughs> because the Aprilia obviously came good, yeah, and became a really yeah. competitive bike. Um, oh, I can't remember if Hodgie was here, I remember, or Gav was yeah, here, I, I remember, anyway, I can't remember his. But again, you know, it's like, do I, don't I? Some riders make right decisions, some riders don't, it's, you know. It's, it's, a, it's a fickle thing. It is. About racing. And also there's... There are riders that are on Dorna's radar and some that aren't. There's a little bit of I that. I think as a lot well. of that. I think yeah. I think that's overplayed a lot of the time about how much power Dorna have and what the Dorna do and what Dorna say. I mean, I'm sure they have a. Yeah, of course. I mean, they're running a business, so it's in their interest to make sure. But they don't. At the end of the day, I mean, Jake's. A, there you go. Jake's a classic example because if it was up to Dorna, Jake would be riding next to Quattararo. Quattararo. Um, on Morbidelli's bike, right? Yeah. But it ain't up to Dorna, it's up to Yamaha, who rides what? So Dorna might, well, you know, they all talk to each other, they have their meetings, stuff like that. But at the end of the day, the manufacturer makes the decision. They're the ones who hold the money. They're the ones paying the money. It's, it's their enough. bike. They decide who rides. So Dorna can say whatever they like. And, and I'm sure that, in a, I'm not even sure that they do enough, actually, to be honest with you, in, in that respect. Yeah. Maybe they're not as active as they should. I mean, that's another thing, I think, uh, if Dorna gets sold to another company, I think Dorna will stay as Dorna, but mm. for me, Dorna's probably one of the companies that would shake MotoGP up if they got changed to a, you know, a different company. Maybe that's what MotoGP needs. Controversial, I know, but actually, Dorna have been doing it for a long time now, and, you know, if you look at Formula One, we, we, we've, we've been talking about this a lot this year, you look at Formula One, and, like, Formula One worked very hard on bringing young people into the sport. Yeah. Kids, particularly, right? With TikTok and memes, whatever, you know, all that shit, yeah? And MotoGP don't do any of that stuff, yeah? And so our following is getting older and older and they're dying. And it's like, what? A, what? A, so that's why I wonder whether Dorna actually, who have, who have been brilliant technically, right? Yes. And I love Dorna. They're a great company. They've done a fantastic job with MotoGP, right? And you look at the pictures, watch the world feed for 10 minutes and you'll go, fucking hell. You mean BT don't take their own cameramen and their own feed with them? 
Yeah, they do, yeah. Also, they, they, they take their own producers, and cameramen. No, on each corner. No, no, I'm joking. Yeah, I'm joking. That's us, Dave. That's why we're here. No, no, don't want to do all that stuff themselves. And they're, they're Some amazing. Some people still think, like when you go to tests and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, no, that's not our shit. Yeah, I know, but people don't understand the, some of the nuances of TV, do they? No, that's all Dawn. But obviously, you know, and Dawn have done a brilliant job with with what you see on the telly. Yeah. You know, all the super, like the shots are flipping amazing, the cameramen are amazing, everything is brilliant about and the high it. high motion stuff and being in the right place, right incredible. time. Incredible, there's so many areas. Yeah, the graphics yeah. and the information you get, all the tyre information you get, all that shit, brilliant, fantastic, amazing, technologically superb. But where is the championship going? So, you know, the championship looks like it's in real jeopardy at the moment with the front tyre pressure situation, yes. yeah? Yes, Aero situation, yeah? Um, now, I know, you know, these problems are incredibly complicated things. They're almost unsolvable puzzles. It's like you've got a better chance of solving the problems in Gaza than working out, right, someone making a decision between the MSMA and the FIM and Dorner and the rights holders and the TV companies. So they're really, really complex problems, but that's why you wonder whether Dorner actually do need do need to change and bring in a company, maybe like a Liberty Media or something that I don't yes. know, but someone that actually will turn around and go, hang on, we're going on a bad street here. We need to... Stop up the stop the car, get out and go in a different direction, yeah? Because it looks to me like we are running down a down a road of jeopardy for, for MotoGP. And actually if that ties in with a time when big TV companies come along and don't want to put want to make big drastic changes and cuts and stuff, it could be like fucking hell, we could become a really niche sport yeah. in a very short space of time, I think. We do miss out, I think, on the younger generation now. We we We're are not making a, any provision for them at all. I'll tell you where we are an old um, viewing public yeah. in motorcycle race, older yeah, demographic. Yeah, we are. And that's where I think, that's where I, uh, another reason why I've always admired, why I, why I like BSB, because they've always made concessions for, bring your kids, yeah, bring schools in or whatever it is, yeah, they make, they, they it's not rocket science and they get it, right? Whereas most GP is still like, they still put up a, you know, a wrap around the paddock so people can't see in the paddock. And I understand they're protecting their rights and their exclusiv exclusivity. Yeah. I get that side of it, but at the same time, it's like, hey, look at the, well, they don't look at the big picture because it's about money and dividends and stuff like that. So they're not worried about the big picture. They're just worried about what they're bringing in at the time. They're not worried, probably not worried about the future. No. So that's why I wonder whether maybe now would be a good chance for to change, whether it's Dorna or I don't know, but make a big sweeping change because Formula One is looking, their future is looking pretty good and ours is looking pretty bleak, I think, MotoGP. And also it showed that little bit with the, um, with the MotoGP documentary they did their version of Drive to Survive. Such an opportunity. It fell flat. How can you For make me, something? You, you, how can you do something go so, so badly, good, yeah. so badly? Yeah. And it was well, there great so there they had there, the access, There's a really good example. But it just didn't work. Are Dawn of the right company still? Okay, they're brilliant technically, but are yeah. they still the right company to be driving MotoGP in the direction it's going? And do we need to look at, I mean, the, the, you know, the, the tyre pressure thing and the aero thing and the ride height, device thing mm. they're really serious issues i don't ever remember i mean that's where you need to speak to your julian riders or your gavin emmett's because they'll they might think of other situations where where motor gp has been in this feels like a bit of a crisis to me and actually you know it's come up really quickly but we did there was potential this year for last year for peko bagnaya to be crowned champion and then half an hour later to be have the championship taken away from him right that was a potential thing so that needs dealing with. Now, 100%. I, I understand the nuances. Obviously, you can't get, you know, we've, we've done this at work, obviously, where you can't get the MSMA and manufacturers and FIMs and all that sort of stuff. They've all got to get together. But fucking hell, man. Sort your shit out. Somebody's got to get in there and sort it out because otherwise we're going to end up with it. We're going to be sitting here going, well, can the last person turn the lights off? And it's like, fucking hell, you know, we saw the iceberg and nobody said. No. Uh, what is it hard to starboard. Hard to starboard. Move it out the is way. Is that what it is? Yeah, hard yeah. to starboard, yeah. 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 I was, we had Frankie Carcedi on on the show um, a few weeks ago. Oh, yeah. And What did he say? We asked. I asked him that very question, you know, what would you change in the sport? And he was very critical of the, the front tyre pressure because it's yeah. so difficult to get that right. And how riders now, and the, the listeners and the viewers will have watched the, the show, of how now riders are managing a race. It's not the fastest rider to ridiculous. the flag anymore. It's ridiculous. But you know there's a really easy fix. Take the aero off, take the ride height devices it's off. It's not even the aero, it's the ride height devices. 
He wants that they're, taken they're, away they're as well. Get rid of them, and actually, so you can't get rid of ride height devices, yeah, because if you get, and this is the sad thing about it, right? Mm. So you get all the all the five manufacturers, right? And you go, right, listen, everybody, this gig's fucked. Job's fucked if we don't sort this out, yeah? And everyone goes, right, okay, so we've got to sort it out. So what are we going to do there? Right, well, what we're going to do is we're going to get rid of the ride height devices, yeah? And everyone's like, brilliant. Let's take all the ride height devices off. It'll save us money and we'll get rid of them, right? Okay, let's have a vote. Who wants to take the ride height devices, yeah? And fucking Yamaha and Honda put their hands up and KTM might even put their hands up. Aprilia might even put their hands up and Ducati go, no. Nope. And it's got to be unanimous. <laughs> yeah. Which is like... It's just ridiculous. It's it's a democracy, ridiculous. you can't work on un so unanimous decisions all the time. The only thing that they could do, they can ban ride height devices on safety grounds. Yeah. So... But that's going to take a big accident first. Well, there you go. So now, now you have to... Well, but we're, 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 we are having those big accidents. We are having those accidents. People are locking the front. Look at... Um, true, yes. So, so, so those things are happening, yeah? So are Dorna the right company to take the championship forward again? Because you look at them and you go, why, why, you know, or it, it's, I, I'm not, I'm not the most knowledgeable person on this subject, right? You need an Oxley or you need an Emmett or yeah, something like that. Sure, you need yeah. one of those guys, right? I'm not the most thing. But at the same time, you have to look at it and say, well, you know, what is happening with this subject? Why is no one mm. talking about it? Why are they not, you know, surely we could have sorted this out the week, you know, over the, <laughs> over the winter. Why don't we just ban ride height devices? Because that would keep everybody happy. The championship's yeah. back on track. We don't have to worry about the tyre pressures. It kills it. Cures a lot don't of worry evils, about turn yeah. one incidents like Austria and Catalonia <sighs> heading into turn one faster than they ever have done, all for the same six. It's six turning feet into of um, it's like politics, isn't it? It's like why don't we just all you know? It's, it just, it's just it isn't <laughs> an answer, is there? This the, the, is the, the iceberg is there, and we can't. Yeah, uh, you know, and it's and there, you it's staring you in the face. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. What does what does twenty four hold for you? More of the same with MotoGP? MotoGP again, yeah. 20, oh, it was 22, it's 21. It's probably going to be 20 when they get rid of Kazakhstan. I don't think Kazakhstan's very likely to happen. So 20 rounds of MotoGP. Flipping brilliant, can't wait. Still enjoying the travel? It's weird. Enjoying new no, place. I'm not enjoying the travel, actually. No, the travel... Mate, that's different past I, I'm enjoying the travel. Well the flying's a flipping pain in the ass. yeah. But, um, like, I'm really enjoying uh, the job. Like, I love the producing. I work for a really good producer. Kev Brown, my boss, is flipping brilliant. Um, and I work with some other people that you know, Alana, and like the crew are flipping yeah. brilliant on that gig, yeah? I love them all. They're my friends. We all look after each other. We all do a flipping hard job. We work like flipping maniacs. And we've all become really, really good mates. So the job is flipping brilliant. Um, the travel's a pain in the ass. 20 rounds, meh. I could do with the money. So I'm well up for it. It's ironic that I just... Just, I'm like, hey, um, you know, before an engine blows up, it starts running for about 30 seconds. It runs really, really well. That's my career right now. The peak <laughs> <laughs> That's it. It's just about to blow up. I've got one more season and it's just started firing really well. And I'm actually, for the first time in 20 years, really looking forward to work <laughs> just before it goes pop. So you've got to go pop all out of your control as well. Yeah, there you go. Mate, this has been absolutely fantastic. Cheers, Dave. I've I've thoroughly enjoyed, it, mate. enjoyed what, this challenge. Time has flown, mate. Sorry, I've rambled on. No, no, so this is what it's about. This is what it's about. Every, oh, in fact, <clears> two <throat> questions to finish because I forgot to ask Frankie this. Oh, did I forget? I've forgotten to ask somebody this question recently in the, in the chats I've just done. Um, predictions, please. BSB, World Superbike, MotoGP oh, champions, shit. please. You could have told me you were going to ask me that. Nope. BSB, <laughs> um, John Reynolds. Okay. Uh, World Superbikes, oh, BSB. I'd quite like to see Glenn Irwin win, although I like I, like, I like him all. But yeah, I mean, yeah, I don't know. I don't know who's. I don't know who's going to win BSB. But um, World Superbikes. Um, well, it's a tricky one, isn't it? Bulega. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's. I remember um, talking to him. He's crew chief Giovanni Krupe. He's he's working with Sam Lowe's this year. Who we all know, right? Yeah, from Shaky, yeah, right? That's right. A really yeah. good bloke. And actually, I got to know him. Like, I knew him pretty well from BSB. And then when he came and started working with Nico on the world, we really bonded, became, yeah. became good friends. Great, great bloke. And one of the most talented, intelligent, articulate people. And I remember him saying to me the year before last, when Nico first started riding the whatever it is, what is it? A 959 nine, 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 or something? 959, nine, nine, like yeah. yeah. And Giovanni was like, He's fucking really good, 
but the bike is shit at the moment. It was brand new. It was a brand yeah. new project. And he said, he's really, really good. Keep an eye on him. And actually, um, he did really well, but the bike let him down a lot. Stick him on a good bike, pff, gone. So actually, I'm kind of not surprised. And there was a lot of stuff about him when he came into MotoGP and Moto3 and all that sort of stuff. And he never really found his form. So he had a lot of think, outside issues, didn't he? Yeah, the, there, there was, he was stuff going the on. next Valentino it, Rossi. I think he and... might be, it wouldn't, do you know what? I wouldn't be completely surprised if he came along and demolished it. Alvaro. He's not fit. I don't think it's about fit. I think, I'll tell you what, he's lost his advantage. And I don't rate Alvaro like I rate Jonathan Ray, Top Rack, possibly Nico Bullega now. Yeah. I just don't rate him. So I think Alvaro on an equal footing is, is going to get destroyed by Top Rack and Jonathan for sure. But we know mentally, he's, I don't think he's that strong when things go against him sometimes. Um, I don't 19 know about that. I that. think he probably learned quite a lot in Honda and stuff like that. I think that was what made him quite yeah, strong. True. But I think actually at the end of the day, right, he's had a massive advantage because he's absolutely minute running Man child on the world. Yeah. And, I, and I firmly believe that, right? If you don't, if you, I know this is going to start, people are going to get really pissed off with it. And I know the people that are going to get pissed off with me, but the fact remains, right, you just have to look at the physics, yeah? If you're really small, okay, so everybody has little advantages and stuff like that, but Alvaro's advantage is the ability to literally just pull around someone and overtake right and if you speak to any of the riders even though they were, or if you ask them on tv they'll go well you know blah 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 but actually behind the scenes they were like this is fucking ridiculous yeah you've got a, you know it's just not fair yeah. yeah so top back's really good on the brakes jonathan ray's really good on everything else and that that's really cool alvaro just can pull over, out and overtake because he's on a faster bike and that's boring for me even though they had some incredible races last year, but that is only because Top Rack and Jonathan are so skillful yes. that even on shitty bikes that they're riding compared to Alvaro's, they can just about keep up with Alvaro. Make him, keep him honest Alvaro for on a the bit. same bike, Alvaro's nowhere. For me, right? And I that's don't know fair. anything, but that's my opinion. And I can say that now because I don't work in World Superbikes. <laughs> so I think Top Rack could be really strong. Sylvan going to BMW as a test rider could make a humongous difference. BMW have never... Never had a test They've team. never, but they've never done what they think. The thing about BMW is they want to win so badly, right? And I think that's probably part of the reason, obviously a big paycheck plays a part of it for Top Rack, but they want to win. And actually Yamaha have won and they're not that bothered, they're not bringing anything too new. Kawasaki definitely aren't, that, don't seem that's that key anymore. Bike, you, know, the fun, you have to look at the global financial crisis and what's going on. So BMW do still want to win, I think. And actually the changes that Sylvan will bring him with a bike. The bike is really weird. That's the one thing I've picked up over the years, right, talking to riders, is that the BMW is an odd fucking bike, yeah? And it doesn't do normal shit. I mean, it doesn't do the things that you want to do. I, mean, I can't wait, actually. Um, also, I get on really well with Sylvan, working with him in Murder GP. Yeah. What a flipping brilliant bloke. But also, get to have a few drinks with him sometimes <laughs> when he gets a bit loose-lipped. So I can't <laughs> wait to find out about what he really thinks about the BMW, what it's like. And actually, I think Sylvan, I think you'd be fair to say that Sylvan's one of the highest regarded test riders in the world. No Probably question. only second to maybe Danny Pedrosa, yeah. but Sylvan's got a very, very, he's well known for having a really incredible feel and so on and so forth. So it'd be really interesting to see what, A, what he brings, but also what he thinks of the bike. Um, and obviously the BMWs look like they're doing quite well in testing, so. And it's not for this year particularly. It's for the 25 bike. Might be for the 25 bike, on. yeah. There'll exactly, be some yeah. upgrades this I, I year. I think they might, might But change, I yeah. think their biggest input is going to be for the 25 bike. Oh, yeah, it's going to be flipping brilliant. And actually, um, I think Jonathan on the Yamaha, from what I hear, and I've heard from a couple of people that are quite close to him, that actually he's really happy with it, loves every minute of it. So you just don't know. And actually, if you take Alvaro's massive speed out of it, Jonathan and Toprak actually weren't, you know, are, are still not that far off each other. So it could be. That year, um, whatever it was, 2022, was it? 2020, what was the year Top Rack won? 21? Uh, 21. Because Alvaro was back-to-back like, champion, wasn't he? Every other championship had to take a back seat because that scrap was so unbelievably flipping brilliant. Yeah. It was like, fucking hell. Every, everybody in motorbike racing has got anything to do with it should realise that actually... All people want to see is really good racing on the That's track. All it is. That's the recipe for success, yeah? Even if you're flipping talent cup, it doesn't matter, no. yeah? You've just got to have good racing. And the moment you lose that, you've got to change something to get it back. Um, so I hope it's like that. And World Superbikes could be like that. And actually, Motor, G so. Motor GP's got to be really careful because if Motor GP goes up, disappears up its own tyre pressured arsehole, which it could do, could do, then World Superbikes, if it has a good year, could absolutely destroy Motor GP in visibility and that sort of stuff. And that, that could be detrimental to Motor GP. 
Um, so, yeah, World Superbike's going to be brilliant. I don't know who's going to win it. I don't know. I'd love to say top rack. I wish I knew more about it. I wish I was in the paddock still, because I'd have a much better idea. Can I ring Steve English and come back to you on that <laughs> one? He's my man. He'll tell me. He'll He's tell the me. man. He'll tell me who's going to win it. Yeah. yeah. He'll tell me. MotoGP? Uh, MotoGP, I think Marquez. I think he'd be a fool not to bet against Marquez. I'd love to see Acosta win some races. Um, that would be pretty cool, and I think he's got the. Well, it looks like he's got the potential too. Although t I think you know, testing is one thing, and you know, nobody. The, I never in my career is testing really been a good guide to who you know. There's no guarantees, and you don't know what people are doing and all that sort of stuff. So, I'd love to see Acosta win some races. I think Marquez will smash it. Um, what did Frankie say? Do you ask him that? No, I'm sure I forgot. I'm sure Frankie's the sure one I did. forgot to yeah, ask. Yeah, he would. He, well, I, mean, I asked Mark Woodage. I know that. I remember asking Brains. But I can't remember. Did Frankie sound? Did you speak to him about Marquez? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he he, sound... he was he was positive, but because he's he's an engineer, he's data, yeah, he's ones and zeros. Yeah. He will only yeah. take these. Well, uh, the first it's going to be more difficult than people think because he's got to How adjust. It's for him, a new bike. Right. What about phenomenal? What about, I mean, it's so well deserved for Frankie, right? Because the guy Agreed. is flipping brilliant, right? But what an amazing story. To then suddenly find yourself, Mark Marquez, coming off the Honda, the worst year of his life, and now getting onto the Ducati, and he is going to smash everybody to bits, and it's going to be amazing. <laughs> We're all going to get to watch it. It's going to be flipping brilliant. Sorry, we're an alien. Darren just said that MotoGP is going to be crap. Actually, <laughs> <Yes, MotoGP, laughs> MotoGP could be, it could be flipping brilliant as long as the, as long as the technical crap doesn't get in the way. Yeah. Well, it's almost so, like the football VAR thing, isn't it? You you crossing the line it's with the exactly win, that. yeah, exactly. And that. then you think, well, hang that's on, that's the one thing. Oh, my tire don't, pressures. You don't right. Want, yeah, you, yeah. It's not the way to do it. Absolutely not the way to do it. Um, and the final question that I ask every first timer on the show: What's your best hire car story, Charlie? <laughs> oh, they have no need to think about that. Um, it was called a Volkswagen Vento. I had the first ever. This is when I was working in the film business. Oh, my God. How long have you got? We've Two got minutes. Up. I'll Mate, do it really quickly, right? I'm so not even going home. I'm so staying dad, here tonight. We've so got dad, all day. Right, um, <laughs> my dad was with the AA. I would have been probably about 17 or 18. My dad had an AA card, and me and my sister used to use it all the time. And if you, with his card, you got a hire car. So my sister used to lock herself out of a car, and she'd get a hire car. And eventually my dad get a letter from the AA saying, if you carry on using our fucking card, we're going to kick you out of the AA. <laughs> so my dad comes to me and my sister and says if you use my AA card again you're out of the house you're kicked out of the house right so I go to a job in somewhere in London and my I can't remember what I was in I think I was in my sister's Volkswagen Beetle it broke down fuck I'm working on I was working as a location manager so I had to be on jobs at like four o'clock in the morning and I had to be somewhere I can't remember where it was at four o'clock the next morning so I'm like fuck I've got no choice right I've got to ring the AA so I ring up the AA Car's broken out, right? You need to go to South Mim Services and pick up a car. This is three o'clock in the morning. I'm not joking, two o'clock in the morning. I'd come from Pinewood Studios. Get to South Mim and they said, oh, you're, um, we've only got this car. It's brand new. You've got the first one in the country called a Volkswagen Vento. And I'm like, fucking brilliant. Hand it over. Thank you. Anyway, no problem. Went and did the job. I had it for three days. You get it for three days free. I would literally would have been 18 at this. Anyway, so I go and did the job, which was one day. And then I had this car for two days. And on the last day that I had it, I remember going into um, going up for a rag. <laughs> I went for a rag in it, and I put on flipping a Blondie song called. It was either Call Me or Atomic or something. Yeah. I remember going up this road. I know it really well. It's just up there. It's literally up there, and I was going like an absolute mm. flipping loon in this car. And I looked down to change the song or whatever it was. I can't remember what it was. Change the volume, and I looked up, and I was just literally just over the white line, and there was a car coming the other way, and I literally. I didn't even realise I'd lost it until I heard this massive bang. I was like, oh, there was a massive bang. And the next thing I know is I was literally spinning around in the road. I went up a bank and I'd hit, a, basically this guy had come around in a Range Rover with a big trailer on the back and my, the back of my car, this car, had hit this trailer. And I was doing like 90 miles an hour on a beat, it was on a little twisty little B road, right? Anyway, the next thing I know is I didn't even realise, I didn't really, really, I didn't feel the hit of the trailer or anything like that. But the next thing I know is I'm like spinning around in the road and I speared across the road and there were these two trees right in front of me. I didn't have my seatbelt on. <laughs> two trees in front of me. I was like, fuck, I'm absolutely dead. And luckily, as I hit the verge, the car went up on its side and I went between these two trees and down, like a massive drop down into a 
field. All right, <laughs> Rick English. The car. So when, it, when the car landed, it landed right down on its front nose and it almost like it fucking bent the car in half almost. Anyway, massive crash. Luckiest man on the planet. And anyway, I got out of the car, walked up onto the road and this guy came back and he was like, are you all right? And I was like, yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine, thank you. And he said, well, look, you've only clipped the back of my trailer. It's fine. And then just as he was saying that, this woman pulled up and went, you were driving like a maniac. I knew you were going to crash. And I was like, oh my God, I'm flipping dead. Anyway, she cleared off. Anyway, my, um, the tow truck came, put me on the car and I took it back and it dropped me at home. And my mum was there. And she was like, <laughs> what is that? I said, oh mum, forget about it. Anyway, my dad never found out about it. And I got away with it and the AA rang me. I was so scared. I thought I was going to get kicked out of the house. And the AA rang me after about three weeks and they said, look, we have a, a policy where with other, man other manufacturers, we have a knock for knock thing. So uh, you're all covered and uh, you won't be hearing from us again. And I was like, wow. Hallelujah. So I destroyed this Volkswagen Renta, the first one ever in the country, between two trees, nearly died and got away with it scot-free. There you go. Fantastic. Yeah. What a oh, Ask, when, if you ever have Steve English on, right? Yeah. Ask him about our hire car story. That's a completely different one, but I won't tell you now. It's not. Yeah, ask Steve English. That's the question for him. Is that we have got. A I had him on, story. yeah. I never get it's to really be cost in the me same my place. job, actually. Oh, was it? Yeah, Laguna. Yeah, we'll, 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 we'll have yeah. words. So, Steve English at Laguna is another one. <laughs> what a great way to finish, Charlie. That's been fantastic. Cheers, David. Time has that, yeah. flown by. People love talking about themselves as a piece of piss. It's. <laughs> Your own specialist subject. Yeah. <laughs> Let's yeah. do this again at the end of the season. Let's yeah, get the 24 cool. yeah. season done and dusted. Let's see Mark Marquez as champion see and, where things are going. and yeah, go from that. Yeah. And it'd be great to do it again, mate. But Cheers, Dave. Muchos gracias. Ladies and gentlemen, Charlie Hiscott. <laughs>